We're going to call to order the August 8th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. We can begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Present. McPherson? Here. And Friend? Here. Uh, we're going to begin with a moment of silence. Are there any board members who would like to dedicate today's moment of silence? Okay, uh, we're going to have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you just join us in a brief uh, moment of silence, please. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, individual, with liberty and Morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Friend and members of the board, uh, on the regular agenda, item nine, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo packet, page 20, is replaced and reads recommended action, accept and file presentation and update. On the consent agenda, item number 43, there's additional materials. There's a revised attachment, packet pages 578 through 590, replaced contract document. Um, we're replacing our contract document. Thank you, that, that concludes the changes. Thank you. Are there any items that any board member would like to pull from the consent to the regular agenda? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to uh, public comment, which is an opportunity for members of the community to address us items that are not on today's agenda or within the purview of the Board of Supervisors or on the, cons on the consent or regular agenda. If you can't stay, I also understand that we have members from the Safety Net Clinic Coalition here to on our National Health Center week too. So looking forward to hearing uh, from them. But you will have uh, two minutes. Please feel free to step forward. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Esmeralda Rubalcaba, and this is my son, Nicolás Lomeli. I am here to thank the board for this year's proclamation in, in support of Breastfeeding Awareness Month. I am a breastfeeding peer counselor at the Community Bridges WIC program. When I had both of my sons, I was able to bring them to work so that I could continue to breastfeed them. County support of lactation accommodation policies is so important to helping moms like me to be able to provide for our families and also to continue to breastfeed. Thank you for your support of county laws and policies that support working mothers. Thank you for sharing your story. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Um, good morning, members of the board. My name is Azucena Paniagua. I am here also to thank you um, for the year's proclamation of support of Breastfeeding Awareness Month. I am also a lactation educator and a site manager for County Com um, Community Bridges WIC. I was fortunate of being able to pump in my workplace due to the breastfeeding accommodation policies, and I was able to maintain my milk supply, and my children could continue to maintain receive my breast milk benefits. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Hi, good morning. Thank you. My name is Erica Costanzo and I'm the Community Bridges Regional Breastfeeding Liaison for Santa Cruz County. And I'm also the chair of the Santa Cruz County Breastfeeding Coalition. And I'm very happy to be here this morning. And I would um, like to thank the Board of Supervisors for today's presentation of the Proclamation for Chest and Breastfeeding Awareness Month. Each year in August, in more than 170 countries, breastfeeding awareness is celebrated with World Breastfeeding Week and Breastfeeding Awareness Month to encourage breastfeeding and to improve the health of babies around the world. We are here today to help bring awareness to the importance of breastfeeding as a first step to lifelong health. Breastfeeding lays a foundation for better health outcomes for moms and babies, both in the short and long term, including the reduction in the occurrence of many illnesses and chronic conditions. The theme for World Breastfeeding Week 2023 is enabling breastfeeding, making a difference for working families, a big part of the work that we do in supporting lactation and breastfeeding families is to help create and sustain lactation accommodations in workplaces, in schools, and anywhere else in the community that they're needed so that families can continue to breastfeed when mothers return to work or school. It means a lot to the coalition and to WIC um, that the board is recognizing August with this proclamation. And our work does continue throughout the year to help support lactation and educate community on the importance of breastfeeding for both mothers and babies. Our community <clears throat> and um, businesses can also help by supporting and investing in women and their decision to breastfeed in this important effort to improve the health of all of our moms, babies, and families. 
And I'm also grateful to be joined today by several other members of the WIC program and the county's Department of Public Health, all of whom are actively involved in the work of the Santa Cruz County Breastfeeding Coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning. Welcome Good back. Good morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, members of the board, my name is Dana Wagner. I am the director of Community Bridges WIC program, and I'm here to thank you, the Board of Supervisors, for this year's 2023 Proclamation to Support Breastfeeding Awareness Month, and to invite you, each of you, to join WIC for our annual breastfeeding walk this Friday at the Watsonville City Plaza. This is the 16th year that the board has approved a proclamation for Breastfeeding Awareness Month. It is the 16th year of the Community Bridges WIC breastfeeding walk, and I'm thrilled to be here celebrating 16 years of breastfeeding support support in our community with you. Our community organizations have done so much over the last few years to develop policies and practices that promote and support breastfeeding to improve the health of our citizens. We have much to celebrate and there's always more room um, to support the, our new mothers and babies. So please show you continued support and leadership by joining us this Friday, August 11th at our annual event, three o'clock at the Watsonville City Plaza. On behalf of Community Bridges WIC, I thank you very much for the proclamation and for your time. Thank you, thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for holding this space for us. My name is Primavera Hernandez. I am the health services manager for the Children and Family Health Unit. We are part of the county's public health division and we uphold the vision of better health every day for everyone. So today or this month is Breastfeeding Awareness Month, Breastfeeding and Chest Feeding Awareness Month. And myself and my team would like to read the proclamation which you so generously signed. Whereas, Breastfeeding, chest feeding is one of the best public health measures providing health benefits for mothers and birthing parents, infants, families, and societies, keeping mothers and birthing parents healthier throughout their lives and saving the lives of infants. And whereas breastfeeding, chest feeding provides protective factors for both mother slash birthing parent and child and is recognized to help prevent obesity. And whereas human milk is superior to any artificial milk substitute, providing children optimal brain development and an ideal foundation for early readiness. And I will pass the rest of the time to my colleagues. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much for having us. My Do you mind having the microphone? Thank you. My name is Ashley Nyland, and I'm a public health nurse for Santa Cruz County in the field nursing program, also an international board certified lactation consultant. And I will continue the proclamation. Whereas the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that infants be exclusively breastfed, chest fed for six months before being introduced to complementary foods and to continue to breastfeed, chest feed for at least two years. And whereas Watsonville Community Hospital, Sutter Maternity and Surgery Center, Dominican Hospital Santa Cruz, Salud para la Gente, and the Community Bridges Women, Infants, and Children Program maintain certified lactation consultants on staff to support new mothers and birthing parents. And I will pass it on to my colleague. My name is Candy Moreira. I'm a public health nurse for um, the Children and Family Health Unit, and I will continue the proclamation. Whereas all three of our local hospitals, Dominican Hospital, Sutter Maternity and Surgery Center, and Watsonville Community Hospital, have qualified for the prestigious Baby Friendly Hospital Distinction from the National Accrediting Body, Baby Friendly USA, Inc. And whereas the Santa Cruz County Breastfeeding Coalition seeks ways to promote exclusive breastfeeding, chest feeding for six months or more, increase community awareness of breastfeeding, chest feeding importance, create support for lactation accommodation in public and educate families and professionals about sources of lactation support. Good morning, I'm Rachel Van Cott. I'm a public health nurse with Santa Cruz County here and I'm the perinatal services coordinator as well as the SIDS program coordinator. <clears throat> Whereas the Santa Cruz County exclusive breastfeeding chest feeding rate is higher at 87.2% compared to the state exclusive breastfeeding chest feeding rate of 69.4%. And whereas the theme for this year's World Breastfeeding Week is enabling breastfeeding, calling on community collaboration to support breastfeeding. 
And now, therefore, you, Zach Friend, Chair of Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, hereby proclaimed the month of August 2023 as Breastfeeding Chestfeeding Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you for your great work, all of you. They're done. I have a letter from the Mental Health Advisory Board. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. My name is Laura Chatham and I'm a member of the uh, Santa Cruz County Mental Health Advisory Board. And I would like to bring to your attention that the Mental Health Advisory Board sent you a letter, which is the very last item on the agenda today. And I've handed out a copy so that you could find it. I would like to talk to you about issues of sweeping the homeless community. It is clear from research and we all know that the sweeps are cruel, inhumane, and they don't work. The folks swept from the Poganip in the last few weeks are now camping in other places around the town. I would like to tell you about the traumatizing misery and suffering that I witnessed during the sweeps of the Benchlands last fall, but there isn't time in two minutes. Um, but there is time to, to say that we have to stop pretending that we don't know that the sweeps won't work sweeps further impoverished people who already hardly have anything. And it makes it even harder for them to dig out their way out of poverty. We need to stop pretending we don't know how to solve the problem. It is finally time to garner the political will to become the heroes who will solve the problem. Please start by doing the right thing and make enough safe camps for the unhoused folks. Probably the open lot in back of Ross might do or any similar space. Um, and that will help work, move us toward a, a true and workable solution. Folks who are unhoused are Americans like you and me. As Americans, we were taught to value our freedom above all. This includes both the freedom to live and the freedom to walk in the park without fearing for our safety. Please stop the sweeps. Also, please make a plan for how we will take care of our homeless people when the winter storms hit again. Please make a plan to open temporary shelters. Just, uh, just, just please finish up. Tell us, please tell us in advance where our unhoused neighbors can go. Many of them are veterans who lost everything fighting for our country. Please tell us where they can stay and ask the police and sheriffs to stop moving folks out from under the awnings into the rain. It's a terrible thing for our young police officers to have to force. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That's okay. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Hello, I'm Laura Wishart, Program Manager with the Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County, or HIP. I am here today with members of the Safety Net Clinic Coalition to thank the Board of Supervisors for proclaiming this week, August 6th through 12th, as National Health Center Week. Our Safety Net Clinic Coalition, or SNCC, is a comprehensive system of high-quality, affordable care providing an easily accessible medical and dental home, as well as wraparound whole person care for all low income residents. SNCC member organizations serve one in three members of our community. National Health Center Week honors the dedication and talent of community health center employees, celebrating and increasing the mission, resilience and accomplishments of community health centers locally and across the nation. Community health centers serve as the beacon of strength, service and care in their communities. In moments of pain and loss, they offer support and love. In moments of triumph, they offer hope and a vision for the future. These organizations are thriving and expanding because of many factors, dedicated staff, exceptional leadership, access to coverage with the Affordable Care Act and Medi-Cal expansion, and advocacy and support from local leaders such as yourselves. So thank you again for recognizing National Health Center Week with us, and you will now hear from some of our health center leaders. Thank you, thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you. 
Uh, my name is Lucy Silva. I'm with Santa Cruz Community Health. I'm the Health Information Technology Manager, and I'm also the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Chair at our organization. We are driven by a 49-year commitment to healthcare as a human right. Our mission is to improve the health of our patients and the community and advocate the feminist goals of social, political, and economic equality. Since 1974, the Santa Cruz Women's Health Center has played a key role in local health care safety net. What started as a women's health collective founded by a group of UCSC students um, has been over four decades evolved to keep pace with the rapidly changing health care landscape, expanding in size, scope each year to meet the growing community needs. At the same time, our clinic has developed a reputation of demonstrably high care, or prioritize, excuse me, prioritizing care that is rooted in both scientific evidence and genuine human empathy. Our approach is driven by the goal of advancing health equity for all individuals. We continue to expand our most recent, recently having opened a Live Oak Health Center, a beautiful 20,000 square foot facility with Dientes and Midpen. We serve over 12,000 patients, primarily low income, black, indigenous, people of color, and about 10% of our patients are unhoused. We are our people, they're everything. We owe a huge debt to the thanks of the people who do this work with such determination and so well. Our talented, dedicated staff persevered during the pandemic, fires, the recent storms, flooding. Despite these challenges, we move forward together knowing that our work has never been more crucial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning. Welcome back. Hi. Hello, my name is Sherry Storm, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Dientes Community Dental. I'm pleased to be here to mark National Health Center Week 2023, a week that is about celebrating the work done by amazing people who advance the health of our community for those most disadvantaged. In Santa Cruz County, only one in three of our low-income neighbors on Medi-Cal can access the dentist. The need for more access to care is critical. As the largest dental provider in Santa Cruz County, Dientes is working hard to address this issue by opening two new clinics in the past seven months. One uh, in Harvey West at 100 Pioneer Street and one in Live Oak at 1500 Capitola Road. This year, we're expecting to serve 16,000 patients, a 30% growth over last year. We could not achieve this goal without Dante's compassionate and dedicated staff. Yet staffing is the biggest constraint to adding capacity to serve more people. That is why Dante's has heavily prioritized workforce investment including establishing a dental residency program with NYU Langone, providing scholarships for staff to pursue programs for hygiene, assisting, and extended functions, hosting interns from programs like Cabrillo Hygiene and more, and next year starting in a, a registered apprenticeship program in partnership with the County Office of Education Adult Ed. Deante's workforce investment program has created paths so that a high school graduate can come in as an intern and work their way up to becoming a manager or a provider. We're very proud of the diverse work group we've promoted over the years, and this is evidenced by the 92% staff satisfaction rate that we received in our 2023 um, survey conducted by ASR. We're growing, and collectively, this the Safety Net Clinic Coalition has exciting and fulfilling jobs, ones where you can make a real difference. For National Health Center Week, we're here to say public health is a great career path. Please join us. Your community needs you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. My name is Monica Martinez, and I'm CEO of Encompass Community Services, and I'm honored today to be here on behalf of National Healthcare Center Week. At Encompass, we believe that every person deserves an opportunity to live a healthy life. We're the largest health and human services nonprofit in Santa Cruz County, and we offer culturally responsive evidence-based services across the county. And I'm proud that this year Encompass is celebrating its 50th anniversary. We operate 40 different programs across the county in areas of integrated behavioral health, health and housing, and early childhood development, and we serve over 4,000 people every year. One of our most exciting projects right now is that we're moving to expand our integrated behavioral health services in Watsonville. We're developing a new state-of-the-art clinic at, at the Cisa Puede location, and we'll be serving 1,300 individuals after we open the center. We'll be breaking ground in the next few months. 
At Encompass, we have more than 400 employees, and this is truly the heartbeat of our organization. Many of our employees are from this community. Many of them have worked for us for over 20 years, and we believe in the training and development of these individuals to help strengthen the overall healthcare workforce here in Santa Cruz County. For National Healthcare Center Week, we are celebrating our workforce. We're going to be recognizing them throughout the week, and we have selected nine of our outstanding employees to recognize on our website, in social media, and we'll be sharing these staff stories across the county in all of our mediums. So we hope that you'll check that out and you'll learn more about the work happening at Encompass Community Services and by the rest of my colleagues here from the National Healthcare Center Week Coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Friend and Board of Supervisors. I'm Amy Peeler. I'm your Chief of Health Center Services for the County Health Department. And our mission is to promote and protect the health and well being of our community through providing affordable, accessible, comprehensive health and integrated care in our community. In our four health center sites, we serve over 15,000 individuals and over 100,000 visits per year. And we employ over 200 individuals in the county just in our division alone. In our fourth health, in our, we work closely with all of these members of the safety net. And anyone who has entered our healthcare community in our county knows that we collaborate. In addition to primary care, we provide a variety of other services, including acupuncture, orthopedics, and street medicine, where we truly meet people where they are. We work to keep people out of the hospital. We have expanded our substance use disorder services to preserve lives and offer recovery during this horrific opioid epidemic. Hardly a week passes when our homeless person's health project isn't actively saving a life from an overdose. As you're all aware, in addition to serving and taking care of our own patients, we are the county's health, um, sorry, disaster service workers. I'm so tired of the word disaster. <laughs> and are integral to the medical workforce when needed, as we were twice earlier this year in disasters. Thank you for your support and for this opportunity to highlight our role as county-run community health centers and happy National Health Center Week. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors. My name is Donna Young, and I'm the new Chief Executive Officer of Salud para la Gente. Our mission is to provide high quality, comprehensive, and cost effective health care that is responsive to the needs of the communities we serve. In, or, in short, we ensure that our community has a doctor when it needs one. Our work is centered on equity. We are committed to serving everyone, no matter where they come from, the color of their skin, the language they speak, their immigration, insurance status, or income level, who they love, or their sexual orientation or identity. National Healthcare Center Week is an opportunity to celebrate the impact and accomplishments of healthcare centers across the county. We also want to thank staff for their dedication and encouragement of others into healthcare careers. Salud has 13 sites, including three mobile sites, and we have over 450 staff providing bilingual comprehensive primary care that includes medical, dental, behavioral health, vision, chiropractics, social driver screening and referrals, health education, and insurance enrollment, and we serve nearly 28,000 patients. We strive to tackle social factors before they affect health. We believe that everyone should have the opportunity to live a healthy life. Our highly qualified healthcare professionals are deeply committed to community health. Many of our staff were born and raised in Watsonville, and some have chosen to come back and make salute their work home. We have many local hometown heroes who have deep ties within the community and understand the needs of the Pajaro Valley. Our behavior, a behavioral health case management and director Esmeralda Aguilera started working at Salud right after high school. And now years later, she has returned to be part of our leadership team. Thank you for our time and for our healthcare partners that are here today. Salud looks forward to celebrating National Healthcare Week and highlighting frontline staff that inspire and are the backbone of our health centers. Thank, thank you. Morning, Chair Morning. and board. 
Uh, Amber Williams, Janice's chief executive officer and a community member in Santa Cruz County my entire life. Today, if you haven't noticed, we are here in support of National Health Centers Week. We know that a third of our community members are Medi-Cal beneficiaries and, are, and the safety net clinics that are represented here encompass County Health Services, Santa Cruz County Community Health Clinic, Salud, Dientes, and Janice are the catchment and collaborator to aid our community members to meet their medical, dental, and behavioral health needs to support wellness in our community. Janice as a local nonprofit serving 2,500 members, and members Medi-Cal beneficiaries annually since 1978 has served our community with the mission to provide supportive, hope-inspiring, and successful substance use disorder treatment services in a professional and compassionate environment while assisting individuals and families on their journey toward wellness and recovery. Janice will start off National Health Center Week by having those in our mentored internship program, which are paid internships, um, handing out self-care kits to our patients, providing appreciation for our stakeholders, such as yourselves, and honoring our healthcare staff this Friday. We hope you will join us this week in celebrating our collective accomplishments to have a vast array of safety net services available. A few Janus updates. We're excited to announce Janus has been selected by the Department of Healthcare Services to serve as the state's center of excellence, to mentor other treatment facilities in delivering quality medical services that include standing up medication assisted treatments across the state. We were named Santa Cruz County's Narcan Distribution Center and have Narcan available at all Janus locations to assist our community in combating the opioid crisis and fentanyl poisoning that is so rampant locally and nationally. Janus will continue to strive to meet the demands of our community and appreciate your support in our valuable work together to have a healthier, thriving community. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Emily Chung. I'm the Public Health Division Director in County of Santa Cruz Health Services Agency. Our public health vision is for a better health every day for everyone. And I am very privileged and honored to be here to summarize basically the amazing work that our health centers have been doing for the last year and beyond, as well as our partners from the earlier comments around breastfeeding, chest feeding week. We have um, impactful and powerful programs being provided by our stakeholders in the community that improve community wellness for our entire county. The importance of and value of our health centers goes beyond individual lives saved, but also for our general population health and wellness. Part of what our mission includes is to ensure services around an effective system for equitable access to individual services and care, as well as building a diverse and supported health and workforce. Our health centers provide these services. They are an extension of the work as part of our mission, and we're proud to support them. Our health centers drive health equity by providing services in languages for those that need the services, like Mixteco, and using community health workers and promotores. Our health centers also have supported us during numerous emergencies over the last few years, like this winter's atmospheric rivers, by meeting patients where they're at and supporting the most vulnerable. Health centers have also play a pivotal role in fighting COVID-19 and ensuring access to prevention and treatment of infectious diseases. During the COVID-19 pandemic, our local health centers administered over 30% of the COVID doses in our county. Next week, another example of where our health centers really can shine and help us improve our overall health is a special event that Dientes and the Oral Health Access Committee is helping co-host at Dientes Community Dental Care Plaza on Tuesday, August 15th from 2 to 3, where we'll learn about the state of oral health for our whole county. So thank you to our health centers and to our entire health center workforce. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Rachel Sotos. I live on the west side. I'm a recovering academic. I would also like to celebrate um, community health. I think I might come at it with a little more critical viewpoint than some of our esteemed leaders that have just uh, celebrated before us. And I, I'd like to um, suggest that there's actually a crisis in our uh, confidence in public institutions and public health institutions. We might not recognize this in Santa Cruz, but even over uh, over the hill in San Jose, Santa Clara, Palo Alto, Menlo Park, people are talking about this and meeting about it. Um, I'd like to take off from something that Deputy County Public Health Officer David Gilladuch 
Iladarchi said, in, quoted in the Sentinel on the third, and he said that the county uh, public health experts do not agree with the state uh, request or demand to recount the COVID deaths. And apparently um, there, there's been a change in the way Santa Cruz County COVID deaths have been recorded, 44 have been added, and that's simply because all underlying and contributing possible causes have been added to the causes of death. And I think that it invites us to um, take this opportunity to think about what happened in the last two years. Perhaps we might have a truth and reconciliation commission and all of you commissioners could um, give a full account of all of your activities and meetings and the hierarchy and command structure for all decisions that have made. And there's there's many questions that could be asked. I would like to know about the PCR tests. I would like to know um, about uh, the when the when racial injustice was a declared a public health emergency and whether or not we need to revisit that and what kind of changes have been made. Oh, what's the status of all the women who breastfed who were vaccinated? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Morning. I'm Mark Darius Warner. Um, good morning, uh, supervisors. Um, I'm here to uh, speak my mind about the illegal uh, sweeps that the Santa Cruz PD is doing. Illegal meaning it's against um, the Bill of Rights of the U.S. to uh, against civil liberties. Or what, the police are bulldozing people's livelihood instead of holding them for ninety days. The city has a bulldozer that picks up the people's camps and put, put them in a dumpster instead of holding them for 90 days, which is against California law, against U.S. law. And if it continues, there's going to be a hefty lawsuit against the city of Santa Cruz. I've... My my family's been here since 1820 when it was Spanish territory. A lot of my relatives died here in Santa Cruz because of aggression against the indigenous people. They were hung off the Water Street Bridge. <laughs> The police are doing the same thing to the unhoused by taking their livelihood and putting it in a dumpster. It's appalling and it's evil. If they have any Thank Christian you, values, you they should up. stop. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. My name is Martha Matson. I'm an architect with Matson Britton Architects, and I'm here on behalf of a client at 86 Alta Drive in um, Rio de Mar. And uh, I'm commenting on um, the accessory structures and habitable brochure that was available online for years, um, which states, uh, and I've yellowed it out, it's on the second page, it'll be passed to you. If outside urban services line, a thousand square foot maximum uh, size accessory structure is allowed to be uh, to be designed and submitted. Um, we have a project for Angelina Renell, uh, who's an artist. We submitted it. We received back plan check corrections that the code has changed. There now is a rural services line and therefore a thousand square feet is no longer permit permitted. We uh, pointed this out to planning staff, um, have been in conversation with Lizanne Jeffs, who very graciously apologized and removed it from the website yes, uh, last week. However, the fact remains we have a project that has been submitted. We provided a compromise, which actually has been permitted by past planning directors, as well as a project that's under construction with this solution. That's as It's under construction right now that we worked with Annette Olson, another planner, uh, on this uh, uh, solution. 
What we're finding is a brick wall, no compromise. Uh, we were told that, that we were able to crawl through a loophole, and that was what the last planning director had allowed us to do, as well as the planner, as well as other past, past planning directors. We believe that there should be a spirit of compromise between staff and applicants, and we just don't see it. And we come up against this all the time. It's very frustrating as an architect and as applicants. We want to work with planning staff, but we're not given that opportunity. Often we're met with a, a brick wall. Anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Co Britain, Matt, some Britain architects. Um, approximately two months ago, we were here to have a pin pier retaining wall approved. This is a thousand cubic yards that well may kill the people below. This board, I thought, clearly directed the ZA to approve this project. The alternatives analysis that had been submitted has been accepted, and it is agreed that this is the only alternative. The ZA said, I wish I could approve this, but it doesn't meet code ignoring the board's direction. It's an absurd and untruthful comment. This is the general plan, local coastal program. This is at the header for coastal bluffs and beaches. Require property owners and public agencies to control landslide conditions which threaten structures or roads. That should guide every single interpretation of what uh, <laughs> we're trying to do here. And to turn around and after these type of structures have been built in recently and say, no, our code doesn't allow that. We know it can save people's life, but somehow they've come up with some absurd, completely misplaced interpretation and ignored this board's Direction. I have to say, yeah, the rains are coming, Supervisor Hernandez, and it is likely this dirt will come down and hit clients of mine below. And I'm like, going, this is ludicrous. You just sent us back to square one. We're going to have to appeal back up to you again because we have no choice. I request that you, one of you at least, consider special consideration to get this thing immediately back and get it approved. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Gary, Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman, uh, Supervisors. Um, got an article that I just uh, distributed. It is on westernstatesnewservice.com. And it says, uh, it's not about Mickey anymore. It goes into Roger Iger, who is uh, involved with uh, all kinds of pedophilia. Uh, there are at least three pages of Disney being involved in that. Uh, we've recently had the Democratic chairman, uh, whose name is Eric Bauman, uh, the Democratic State Party uh, issued $800,000 in legal uh, uh, cost uh, for his uh, sexual misconduct. Um, also, I agree very much uh, with the speaker before me, uh, this board abolished, that's in like state constitution, the local appeals board, and you appointed yourselves the local appeals board. So if you're approving something, don't run over people like this. The lady that was talking about COVID, also, you took no responsibility. It was paid for by secret money coming from the uh, community foundation that has a social action plan dedicated after a hardcore Marxist uh, that, uh, that gave military information both to Red China and the Soviet Union. Um, Presently, I don't know where the uh, PTA, uh, the Democratic and Republican Central Committees are. We've got the 30 year lowest amount of educational uh, responses uh, from our children. Um, also, while the sheriff is here, uh, I think it's important to mention that Zach Friend, along with another uh, member of the Board of Supervisors, threatened both the persons and property of two granges in this particular county. The sheriff didn't act on it. He's part of the Panetta machine, which you all endorse each other. Uh, there's so much more in here. Ed Buck, uh, the guy that had the third male prostitute run out of his house with a needle in it. Two other people were killed. Ed Buck, uh, 
money both thank you the uh, district attorney and the 40 democratic uh, people join thank you thank you good morning and welcome back hey uh everyone um uh, bruce uh congratulations on your impending escape uh, we got about 70 90 weeks left um so uh, i wanted to talk a little bit about the county's economy i wanted to talk a little bit about how um i feel like um the impulse to just uh yeah, you know, have everybody squeezed out into the margins, um, yeah, and or you know, given a, a choice between uh, fentanyl and and uh, antipsychotics and med medical marijuana, instead of you know giving them an, a real occupation, a real job. And that's just, thank you. Uh, so uh, one thing I've noticed is that. Um, uh, like we've lost a lot of big companies. Uh, I used to look online and, and it, and it was considered to be part of Silicon Valley, Scotts Valley, but no, no longer really. Borland's gone. Um, uh, TI has gone from Santa Cruz. Seagate's gone from, uh, uh, Scotts Valley. Watkins Johnson's gone from Scotts Valley. Uh, Plantronics is gone. Um, uh, yeah, Joby, uh, you know, hey, may may fly someday. I don't know, you know, uh, I don't really see that as like a, you know, there's, we've had all kinds of booms in California. We've had, you know, gold, um, film, um, oil, uh, defense. I mean, we've had all kinds of booms in California. I just don't know if uh, the, the air taxi thing, which is a weak, weak third to uh, academics and tourism in terms of our economy. And, and I, I just don't think it's going to go anywhere. I really don't. And, um, I don't know. I'm thinking about throwing my hat in the ring for the fifth, uh, uh, fifth district. Uh, uh, you know, I just, I don't know, you know, San Lorenzo Valley is a very unique place. It's about 15% of the County's population. Uh, but it does include Scotts Valley, which I think, uh, economically can be contributing a lot more to the County. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning and welcome back. Uh, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural uh, Aptos Hills. I want to first uh, commend staff on the nice change to the agenda, um, segmenting the written correspondence listings. That's very helpful for the public and really gives attention to the, the documents as they are classed. So thank you. I want to... Um, talk about the county's response to the county grand jury's report about cyber attack and that this county does not have in place a very robust uh, plan for dealing with that and, and a response plan. It, it troubles me that the, the only response is, yes, we agree with you that we're um, vulnerable and we're working on it. I would like to see some very specific um, timeline information because this is a real threat and we are thanks to supervisor friend moving very quickly toward a digital wallet for the county and your board has also approved a consultant to investigate vaccine hesitancy of residents throughout the county that would be shared on a national website. I'm concerned about that. And I ask you to stop that all right now until we have a good cybersecurity response plan and prevention. I also um, want to say this is coming up on the anniversary of the CZU fire. I know you're having a report soon uh, from Chief Armstrong, but I am like you, Supervisor McPherson, very disappointed with the slow and very low rates of rebuild. And I want you to move forward to get the Planning Commission and the Planning Department on board with why and to streamline permitting. Why are there so many permits issued and waiting? My last point, and I'll finish up quickly, thank you, is uh, the State Water Board has just uh, uh, completed public hearings for reducing the maximum contaminant level of chromium six. I would like you to write a letter of support for that reduction. We need to address our water contamination in the second district and Thank fourth you. district. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. 
Yeah, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I do not think that Emily Chang or Lisa Hernandez are still in the room. I didn't see Gail Newell. It's quite interesting, the commentary about this being some kind of fertility week. You know, I'm not really quite sure where to begin. I put these plastic straws in my hand because that's one of the things you guys have accomplished. I think you've outlawed plastic straws, but how many tens of tons of plastic during this scamdemic lockdown were just put into landfill? You know, these things may last about 250 years, which is about what 99% of the construction over the last 250 years will only last. This is actually a really exciting time to be a human on planet Earth for seven reasons that I don't have time to go into detail, but the Bible certainly does. So I have a friend that, you know, we're kind of reading some stuff about Socrates and other supposed great thinkers, you know, about what was going on between what is godly and ungodly. I think your guys' jobs are dramatically easier because over the last 120 years, about seven generations, human beings have been greatly weakened. So your your jobs as lawyers and county and city managers and supervisors and city council members are much easier. But, you know, 45 years ago, there were a lot of peace officers. Now they're just law officers. In the only, and so it's a really beguiling situation when you stand outside any building and there's a U.S. and American flag without the corporate pirate fringe on it. So you guys are operating under a dual structure. And it's very frustrating. And the only people being thrown under the bus, more than law enforcement and emergency responders, are children and youth. And that's not really something to be proud of. So, I mean, I could be more direct. I was probably direct enough. But uh, really is tiring saying a mistake because does not become an error unless you refuse to correct it. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online that would like to address us? Yes, Chair. We have one speaker. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, in the conversations about health care for everyone every day and everyone should have the opportunity to lead a healthy life, definitely. And what needs to be incorporated in that is the unhealthy assault on our health by wireless microwave technology. And I'd like to read a statement from safetechinternational.org global. Um, the 5G satellite Internet of Things, and this is the way our county is moving, a data AI juggernaut entails the manufacture, use, and disposal of thousands of satellites in space, millions of new transmitters on Earth, and trillions of IoT gadgets, devices, appliances, and things that together pose one of the greatest threats of all corporation-generated health and environmental assaults. Though so being sold to the public as a way to address climate change, the gargantuan global technology footprint is itself a major contributor to environmental devastation. On top of this, the 5G infrastructure on Earth and in space will escape an inescapable, will create an inescapable planetary digital microwave radiation surveillance grid, which will constitute a huge threat to personal freedom and autonomy. 5G and satellites play an integral role in the weaponization and commercialization of space, as well as the oceans, and are being used to increase the lethality of war. war. Thank you, Ms. Karen. Madam Clerk, is there anybody else online? Yes, we have one more speaker. Bernie Gomez, your microphone is now available. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair, Board of Supervisors, buenos dias, good morning. Uh, Bernie, you can now speak. 
All right, sorry about that. Uh, good morning, Chair and uh, Board of Supervisors. Just a quick comment on the civil grand jury's re uh, recent report on continuing to kick the can, right, um, around jails. And I just, I would like to say that, um, you know, we there is this uh, this narrative, right, that uh, if you construct better facilities, uh, if you have a state-of-the-art jail or prison, you know, that people will be rehabilitated. Um, and that in the South will create, or not in the South, but that but new facility will create uh, a sense of public safety, right? And I believe that's a, a very false narrative because, you know, the punishment is not in when you get locked up, right? When you're in there, it's like the real challenge punishment is actually when you're released and when you're trying to figure out life and, uh, you know, dealing with the traumas and struggles and all those things, right? Uh, post, post incarceration. So, um, regarding, you know, even thinking about constructing something new, um, I really think that if that's the case, you also need to think about constructing the alternative, right. To help reduce the, the state of incarceration that, uh, that we find ourselves in, you know, uh, jail shouldn't be a de facto mental health uh, facility, right? It shouldn't be a substance uh, uh, use disorder facility. Um, and I can go on and go on and on. So, you know, also the last thing I will say is that the shortage, shortage, shortage uh, staffing uh, that we're seeing is not, it's, it's not, um, something unique to Santa Cruz is happening all, all across the nation, the, the state. Um, and money is not going to, you know, get, get us out of the state of we in the state that we're in. Right. So just looking for the alternative and uh, looking forward to seeing where this goes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else, Madam Clerk? No more speakers, Chair. All right. We'll, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for consideration of the consent agenda and comments on the consent agenda. I'll begin with Supervisor Hernandez. Do you have any comments on the consent agenda? I do. And also, um, I, I wanted to acknowledge and thank everyone that was here for uh, National Health Centers Week and for National Bre uh, Breastfeeding Month. And I plan to be there on Friday at the plaza as well. Um, I, I do have uh, items 30, 31, 32, 33. I wanted to thank my new commissioners uh, for taking on this endeavor. And I really think that it is the first step to uh, being a public servant as well. And um, so I want to thank my Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commissioner, uh, Daniela Suarez, uh, my other Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commissioner, Brooke Sampson, and my Housing Advisory Commissioner, uh, Bianca Alvarez, and my mental health advisory, uh, Celeste Gutierrez. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for everyone who came uh, to speak uh, to us this morning. Um, I had a couple comments. Um, item number 20 I saw was the uh, status on American Rescue Plan Act recovery plan. Um, and this is kind of tangentially related, but I think it would be good for us to also get an update um, in the near future about uh, the, the status of the FEMA reimbursements. I know that, um, you know, we're still hoping to see those funds come into the county and um, help us as we recover from the various disasters that we've had. And so it'd be really good if we could get an update on that and see how we can, um, you know, what role we can play in terms of reaching out to our federal elected representatives if it's continuing to move very slowly because these funds are really critical for us to um, maintain the county's operations. Um, on item number 23, um, my apologies for not being able to reach out sooner, um, but I, I would like to see if, and this item is the approval of the contract for the one-stop uh, permit uh, center here at the county. And I, I, I think it would be good for the board to receive the plans for um, what that project's going to be. I mean, this project, it's $2 million for creating this one-stop shop for, um, um, for CDI. And I think that as part of the packet, it would be good for us to just see what those plans are so we can understand where these costs are coming in at, um, since it's going to be a $2 million project. Um, in addition to that, um, my last comment is on item number 24. 
disposal of the surplus property and request. And I would just like to ask, um, this is going back to some conversations we had previously when I was on the city council, but um, the downtown outreach um, program that the city has, many of those workers don't have vehicles and they would be more than happy to help transport people who are having mental or behavioral health issues to um, the hospital or to, um, you know, if they need to go to the homeless shelter. And one option that came up is that if there were at any point in time surplus vehicles, they could be donated to Encompass so that they, those workers could have vehicles to provide those services, that they would be open to having those conversations. And so if there's any vehicle that may be utilized in that capacity that could be donated to uh, Encompass for their downtown outreach worker program, I think would be really helpful for being able to help transport people who are having mental and behavioral health issues to um, the appropriate services. And so that's all the comments I have. And unfortunately, I'm leaving after this meeting to go to the Coastal Commission meeting in Oxnard, so I won't be able to join on Friday, but um, I hope everybody has a wonderful event in, in Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for item 21, the um, accepting and re replying to the three grand jury reports, I want to take the opportunity to thank the members of the grand jury who uh, really largely volunteer for this effectively uh, and dig into various issues uh, throughout our county. And uh, the reports that we've got here today, um, of course, three out of the total eight that were completed this year, um, you know, in some cases, they uh, praise the county's process, like uh, on our, our core process, to distribute grant funds to various nonprofits. Um, and others, they find opportunities for improvement, um, like the jail report and uh, the cybersecurity report. But I think regardless, uh, the detailed reports always provide a great opportunity for dialogue, both within uh, among county staff and with the public, and have been uh, having lots of interesting conversations around these reports. Um, and so just really value the work that the civil grand jury does. On item 23, the architecture agreement for the one-stop permit center that uh, Supervisor Cummings mentioned, um, I think that we've had plans associated with uh, attached to previous items um, that we could certainly uh, find and um, to take a look at. Um, I'm really excited to see this project move forward. Of course, we've done a lot of work internally uh, on the organization to uh, streamline permitting um, and, you know, I think having a physical space to help operationalize that is really going to be beneficial. Um, yeah, we're glad to see that the design of the space has involved meetings with over 100 participants who are directly involved in the permitting process so that uh, ultimately it's going to reflect the people, uh, reflect the needs of the people who use it every day. Uh, and finally, I also want to thank everyone who came out today uh, for Breastfeeding Awareness Month, as well as the chair for issuing the proclamation. We do have a three month old at home who is uh, breastfeeding quite frequently. And of course, my wife going back to work, I can understand um, you know, really what a, a huge commitment and sacrifice so many women make uh, to really bring all of us into the world. And I hope that every child has uh, the opportunity to be close to their mother that way. And I know that um, the, the closer they are uh, with their mother and both their parents, uh, the stronger uh, and more loving we all become. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to say thank you to each and every one of the volunteers and uh, staff members who came here to recognize National Health Centers Week. Uh, those are hundreds of people that are serving thousands of our county, thousands of our county residents. And they're, they're making a better life for many, many people. And they're to be congratulated. And I thank you, thank each and every one of them for their service. I too would like to... Um, and respond a little to the grand jury uh, responses that we received uh, on item number 21. I want to thank the county departments who played a role in drafting these responses and uh, for the county and the, and the community members who serve on the grand jury. It's hundreds of hours for them to do that. It's a very critical issue. And in particular, on the core report that uh, it was really a validation of the county's transition to a competitive uh, word process for the core that allowed us to consider new programs with uh, value to the community. Um, I have felt for some time that the county has been unduly criticized regarding the core process. And I'd like to quote just a, a little from what the grand jury said about that. Quote, this investigation was to determine if there were any inefficiencies, waste or abuse in the process. 
And it is the jury's belief that the court process is being administered with integrity, transparency, and to create equity of opportunity for all applicants. And there were 128 applicants for $15 million plus, and we had $5 million to allocate. The jury found that significant time and resources were spent to communicate with and to support all potential applicants, end quote. I couldn't agree more having gone through the development of the core process. And when, when again, uh, once again, want to thank the county's uh, human services department staff for its work and um, to ensure that a competitive core process works so well and with transparency. Uh, it has also been mentioned about our county jails. We all know that it's clear that we need to address physical improvements for the main jail in the coming years. And I'm glad we've made some step, steps to address that. It's going to take some time to, to get that uh, done. Uh, as far as cybersecurity, which has also been mentioned, a huge uh, new topic, and I really appreciate, especially uh, Chair Friend's um, uh, in, involvement in this. Um, it's become more serious by the day as cyber crimin criminals become more uh, and more sophisticated. Uh, I'm glad we're working on the comprehensive plan, and that's that's the issue. We're We're directing some attention to it and i hope we can get to a plan and a resolution of what we should be doing to uh, address this issue in the near future thank you mr chair thank you is there a motion for consent from one of my colleagues i'll move the consent agenda second all right we have a motion from supervisor hernandez a second from supervisor koenig if we could have a roll call please supervisor koenig aye cummings aye hernandez aye mcpherson aye and friend all right, and that passes unanimously. We'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is a presentation by the graduates of the 2023 Young Supervisors Academy, as outlined in the memo of uh, Supervisor Hernandez. And we do have the board memo. I'll kick it to Supervisor Hernandez uh, for the introduction of this item. Supervisor Hernandez? Oh. Do we have a different order? Do you, are you guys going to go first and then I'll go? Okay, yeah, we're different order. Can you just introduce? First of all, I want to thank all the all the all the families, all the parents of the 2023 Young Super uh, Young Supervisors Academy, and I want to thank all my staff for being flexible and accommodating. And I want to thank Celeste and Jennifer Hernandez, Celeste Gutierrez, uh, that'll lead the presentation. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's a little bit, um, I don't know what the word would be. It's almost like deja vu. The last time we were here, we had our mock supervisors, our young supervisors mock graduation. And this was all filled by students, like every single position, including CAO, county council, um, the board of the clerk. Um, so it's a little bit surreal being here today. Um, thank you all for being here. And I just want to share that um, the Young Supervisors Academy was really started to be able to give to be able to um, help young people in District 4 develop their leadership skills and their team skills, and also learn how local government, agriculture, business, and the community are interconnected, and also as a long-term investment in young people. When young people are able to see themselves in these different positions right now, when they're still in high school or they're about to start college, it gives them this vision of what their future can hold. And what we learned, and you'll hear from some of the participants, is that often when you are exposed to certain ideas or possibilities, the likelihood of you actually pursuing that increases exponentially. And what we learned when we went to different departments or visited with different business owners is that oftentimes people ended up pursuing careers that their parents had, or they were, I won't mention any names, they were writing when they were in college, like I'm going to be the director of public works in Santa Cruz when they were 18, 19 years old, and now they work in public works. So I share all of this because really we wanted the participants to step into their leadership, but also to start thinking about, you know, what, what can I do to go off to college, learn, explore new ideas, and then bring it back and invest into my own community in the future? And we visited many different places. Um, the students actually met with some of the people that are in the room here today. And it wasn't just um, county departments. They also visited the Watson Water Treatment Plant, which was a field trip in and of itself. Um, they learned about how all the different waterways are interconnected, visited the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, 
the art, how the arts are interconnected with this as well. And different farms, as you all know, District 4 has a lot of farms. And some of the feedback that we, we have participants that will share their feedback today, but some of the feedback that we got from, not everyone is able to come today, is that it made them feel a lot more aware of their own local community and that they might consider getting involved in local government as we all have heard plenty of times from various departments of how hard it is to hire people because of how expensive it is to live in Santa Cruz County by actually hiring people that live here that help solve some of those problems. And this is a picture. We were actually here in chambers of the first class and I'm going to pass it over to Jennifer. Good morning, board members. I am Jennifer Hernandez, and I am privileged to introduce myself as an intern under the guidance of Supervisor Hernandez, while also playing a vital role in the Young Board of Supervisors Academy. It fills me with great pride to recount the experience of educating young minds about the significance of local governance. Our program catered to a diverse group of high school and early college students, and it was immensely rewarding to witness their journey of enlightenment throughout the duration of the academy. One of my responsibilities involved curating and analyzing survey feedback from the participants. A prevailing theme that emerged from the responses was their profound appreciation of the field trips to the different departments which provided them with a connection to the workings of local government, one where they learned the importance of networking, and it was a discovery of previously unknown career paths, which broadened their horizons and fueled their aspirations. We initiate, initiated discussions with different departments to witness the current government status and explore how our voices can make a difference in bringing about change. It is with enthusiasm and gratitude that I present this report. The impact we've made on these young minds serves as a testament to the power of education, exposure, and active engagement. I look forward to continuing our shared mission of nurturing informed and empower future leaders as I am one and one that will encourage others. I sincerely urge the board to contemplate the possibility of organizing similar academies in the future. Having personally witnessed the tremendous benefits from exposing young individuals to the inner workings of local government and facilitating the discovery of their passions, I am convinced of the lasting impact such initiatives can have. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll actually hear from some of my mic off again. Okay. And now we'll actually hear from some of the participants from the Young Supervisors Academy. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Selena Salvador from Santa Cruz County District 4. I am a first generation incoming freshman at San Jose State University, where my focus is social work. I will briefly talk about my experience at the Young Supervisor Academy. As a resident of the city of Watsonville, the opportunity to meet with the different departments I feel has helped me learn more about my town as a whole and even obtain a possible internship job that will help me succeed in my profession. I was only able to obtain this opportunity as we connected with people so close working in my city. Being exposed, I am excited to hopefully be working and serving my community. From day one, we were exposed to knowledge, knowledge that made our brains hurt, but in a good way like how and why we should support our Watsonville stores and also understanding the importance for us, the youth, to come back and serve in our community. I want to encourage you all to offer this opportunity to your district youth, as having experienced it myself, when students have the opportunity to, to exposure, it brings opportunity, like us visiting departments that can offer jobs as young as 16. It will also help them learn about the different jobs available as they meet and connect, where they discover they don't have to move far away in order to do what they love. It also helps build their resume, but just the experience and connections built benefit them as they practice their leadership skills, communication, and taking opportunity for themselves. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Isabel Lovato Vicencio, and I was a part of Mr. Hernandez's Young Supervisors Academy this summer. I would like to share some of the experiences I had while being a part of this program. I thoroughly enjoyed going to the various field trips across Santa Cruz County, which included the Public Defender's Office, the Sheriff's Office, and the Beach Boardwalk. I was able to learn more about the different legislative and community-serving jobs District 4 and Santa Cruz County has to offer. 
I hope that this Academy Moment will continue to inspire and encourage more students to learn more about their community and how they can serve them. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Mariana Lovato Vicencio, and I'm about to start my senior year at Watsonville High School. When I first heard about the Young Supervisors Academy, I instantly knew that would be a great program to join. Throughout the program, we were able to visit various places and people who are part of our community and learn more about what they do. I was able to learn more about local government and about my community through this program. I was also able to meet new people who made this experience so much fun. All in all, it was a great experience, and I hope that more students in the future are able to enjoy this experience. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm Fatima Nava, one of the students from Young Supervisors Academy. The four weeks of this program, I've learned a lot about our community, county, and the jobs that help build on it. With the topic about our community, I am more aware of the issues and how our youth can help create a better future for our town. This opportunity has also inspired me to not give up with pursuing in law after high school. Thank you to Athena and Aljla from our community's public defenders team. When you're choosing to hold this program for your district, um, for your district, you're helping your youth and their future. If the Young Supervisors Academy has inspired me to become involved in the future of Santa Cruz County for District 4, it can also inspire your teens to become future board leaders. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I am Elisa Magaña, and I'm one of the students that participated in the Supervisors Academy. This program has been an eye-opening experience that has inspired me to become a leader in my community. Without this academy, I would have never known about the opportunities that are out in the world, especially in my community. Making connections and gaining insight of how our county works has been beneficial for my peers and I. It would be incredibly beneficial for other districts by making this opportunity open for the youth you're investing in the future of our county. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Joanna Rosas. Um, I was a student participant in the Young Supervisors Academy. Um, I'm very glad this academy was brought um, to District 4 as it did give us the opportunity to learn more um, <coughs> Uh, opportunity to learn more about how our city county works and the opportunities we have in our community and i'm hoping that with the young supervisors academy being brought to district four it helps motivate other districts as well um to bring this program into their districts as it is a great way to expose and inspire the youth on how to be more involved in their communities it was honestly such a great experience and i'm honored to be uh, part of the first um, class and I strongly encourage for youth in District 4 to sign up for next year's um, academy. And I want to thank uh, Felipe, Celeste, Jennifer, and Ramon who isn't here with us today, but it was honestly a really great idea to bring this um, um, to, to our community. And thank you. Thank you. So I, I really want to thank staff that put this together with Ramon, Celeste, Jennifer, but especially Celeste that really uh, spearheaded this endeavor and put it all and put it all together, uh, and for always being there for the students as well. Um, I have to say that I was immensely proud of all the students and all that. You know, it was proud of the outstanding uh, young adults that we have here today, who who um, you know comprised this first inaugural class of the Young Supervisors Academy. It brought me, you know, a lot of joy to witness these bright young minds, um, you know, dedicating their, their summer and delving into the inter intricate workings of, of our local and county governments. Uh, their decision to invest their time, their energy into this, into this endeavor uh, reflected their exceptional character and their sincere commitment to making positive impact in our community. You know, the, this program, uh, the Young Supervisors, was started uh, in 2012 by Super Monterey County Supervisor uh, Luis Alejo, and it's the first of its kind of program um, to introduce young leaders to local government, politics, uh, public policy, and leadership. When I was elected to, into office, I wanted to bring it to Santa Cruz County, specifically to District 4. Um, as you know, in, in District 4, South County, District 4 specifically, has over 
thirty percent uh, young people under uh, under the age of eighteen. Uh, as you know, the city of Scotts Valley has and that's over fifteen thousand people that are under the age of 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 eighteen in District Four. Imagine all of Scotts Valley being under eighteen. That's what we have in Watsonville. Um, over fifteen thousand people that are under eighteen. This program was also created because when I was young and my family, we didn't know any politicians, council members, supervisors, congress members, or senators. So this academy was created to be that family connection to public servants and to support young people in all that they do, even after the academy is over. The Young Supervisors Academy is really um, equity in action. And I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the departments, all the department heads and that participated in this enriching experience for the young supervisors from the public defendant defender's office, the district attorney's office, the sheriff's office, human health services, public works, elections department, uh, the Santa Cruz County Arts Council, Land Trust, Roaring Camp, or the Boardwalk, Meadipa, you know, a couple of farms that participated in your collaboration and dedication. Um, it was integral to the success of this program. Um, I want to give special, I would like to give a special recognition to the young people from Watsonville whose unwavering dedication truly stood out. Your willingness to be the driving force of change in our community is commendable beyond words. Your enthusiasm and determination to be the difference you wish to see serves an inspiration to all of us. As they, as they engage in these various departments, I knew that this experience would equip them with invaluable insights, skills, leadership, and a renewed sense of purpose. They emerged from this program not only with a deeper understanding of local government, but with a strong commitment to fostering positive change in our community. We all know they couldn't have done it alone. So I would also like to commend all the parents of the young supervisors who took part in making this program successful and facilitating the journey for the kids to be the best that they can be. Congratulations to the first inaugural class of the Young Supervisors Academy. Your actions have set a remar remarkable example for others to follow. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is not an action item, but it's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on this item because it is an agendized item on board agenda. Good morning. Welcome back. Hey, yes. Thank you. My name is James Ewing Whitman. It was actually a pleasure to witness this. It is just amazing the opportunities that youth have. And this is an amazing opportunity. So I just so happen to have several copies of the Citizens Rule Book. It's got some errors in it, but I won't talk about the errors. On page four, it describes how a juror has more power than the president or the Supreme Court, because you can actually question what's going on. Now, I don't invite anybody to uh, actually believe a word I say. They should do their own research. But with this, it briefly describes the three U.S. constitutions. We were a constitutional republic for less than 13 years. So it is really a dog and pony show. So I would think that any mentor or teacher could be like a parent or a grandparent, and you're going to take the good and, and maybe ignore the bad. But um, on page 26 of this, which I gave to those individuals, including some extras, it has our Declaration of Independence. And it clearly described why the folks in the U.S. broke away from the East India Trading Company, which is Great Britain. But the situations going on right now are a thousand times worse with our... Uh, corporations. You know, you guys use interesting language like stockholders, excuse me, stakeholders, individuals like myself, because I'm not part of your machine. You know, I'm considered a useless eater. I don't consider myself a useless eater or any of the individuals. You know, I've spoke about how difficult it is for peace officers who are now law enforcement who walk this delicate line to enforce situations that you guys have created that may be legal, but I mean, who knows how logical or holy or unholy they are. So it's just great to witness you guys trying to do something. And it was great to be able to give them a, a gift. I, I um, don't expect anybody to believe a word I say, but you should certainly do your own research. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. 
Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Supervisor Hernandez, thank you. This is marvelous. And it is so heartening to see these young people here and to know that they spend a lot of their summer learning about government and are excited to understand it better. Maybe one day they'll be all up there. <laughs> That's the goal, isn't it? So thank you. And I challenge the other supervisors to open up programs like this in all districts. It should encompass all districts of the county. And I would like to ask that your board establish a young supervisor's place at the table, two places where each meeting would have two young supervisor graduates or aspiring young supervisors here, watching you, listening to the public, and to establish a young, a young supervisor's commission that would meet regularly, all of them together, share their information, share their ideas, share their enthusiasm for being a public servant, as you all are, and participating in local government and making our communities all better. And that commission would come to you with their recommendations. I challenge you to do this in the next six months. Let's feed on the beautiful work that Supervisor Hernandez has begun and expanded. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us in chambers? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, we have two speakers online, Chair. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, and I was a teacher in Watsonville, and um, a major concern is a problem, I should say, is the toxicity of the pesticides that everyone is exposed to. And um, we had a group farm without harm, that's um, what we should have, ecological and organic agriculture. And I would, I commend you young people. I want to see you have a healthy future without a polluted environment and encourage you to advocate for banning uh, pesticides uh, and and requiring organic and ecological agriculture as well as the wireless microwave technology which is damaging everybody's health i want to give you some references to look up because students study um cellphonetaskforce.org is an excellent source of information um Citizens for Responsible Technology, Children's Health Defense.org, what's more important than defending children's health, including yours? Um, and um, it, it's like the elephant in the room. And I talked to the young person who sat the high school student on Pajaro Valley School District uh, board. She's gone off to college now. And I spoke to her before the meeting about the dangers of microwave radiation causing cancer, et cetera. And she said to me, well, I don't you, think it would be approved you, if it weren't safe. And in a decent... Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there there's another speaker? Thank you. Yes, Chair. Bernie, your microphone is now available. Uh, once again, good morning, uh, Chair and uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, Bernie Gomez with Milpa. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say, uh, commend District 4, Supervisor Hernandez, Celeste Gutierrez, and Ramon, and all involved, right, in creating this and making this uh, happen. Um, it was a very honor and privilege to be able to meet these young leaders this next generation of leaders um and i don't know if they're still 
in the room or not, but I just want to say uh, thank you for uh, taking that leap of faith, you know, and uh, taking that uh, initiative to wanting to learn, to uh, wanting to just uh, uh, experience, uh, explore, right, what it is to be in uh, in government, uh, to learn about how government works. Um, and I just, uh, I just say uh, to you to continue to stand firm in your values, in your cultura, uh, to listen to your experience, right? Um, that will guide you, you know, when you uh, decide to sit in these, in this, uh, these positions of authority and governance, right? Um, you have everything with you, you know, le go learn, get your higher education, um, experience life, you know, and, and, come back come back and and because your community needs you we need you um you're the future and gracias you know i yield my time thank you thank you is there anybody else online there are no further speakers chair all right um are there any comments from board members? Please, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank Supervisor Hernandez and staff for bringing this program to our county. I mean, it's clearly uh, really inspired a lot of our local youth. Um, it was great to hear from them a little bit earlier. And, um, you know, we need our government to be transparent and accessible, especially to young people. Um, one of the biggest challenges our county has is hiring. And so I think that as we uh, continue to in invest in this program and expand it, it'll ultimately be in the county's own best interest because we'll be inspiring people to careers in public service uh, and ensuring the future of our local workforce. So I'm very interested in reviewing the curriculum a little bit more. And I've got all kinds of great ideas um, for how we can improve it and expand it. I, I like the uh, suggestion by uh, Ms. Steinbrenner to form a, a commission that sort of perpetuates this group um, moving forward after the academy itself uh, and definitely look, uh, looking forward for ways to bring it to the first district. Uh, Supervisor Cummings. I just want to thank um, Supervisor Hernandez for his leadership on this effort. Um, as someone who for four years um, ran a nonprofit that was really focused on increasing diversity and leadership in the field of environmental conservation, I know how um, important these kinds of programs are to inspire youth and get them engaged. Um, and especially with local government and, you know, how we're seeing um, fewer people applying for jobs for local government and the challenges with finding even people who are going to run for local government. I think this is an opportunity for us to really educate young people on, in our community on the possibilities of working and being engaged and involved in their local government. And so um, my hope is that you know, we can continue having conversations around how we can expand this and have this be inclusive of all the districts. Um, and also um, think it's a great opportunity for us to engage with um, the local school boards and the uh, county office of education to see how we might be able to scale this and invite them in as partners as well. I know that for um, for the staff and Supervisor Hernandez's office, I know Supervisor Hernandez as well, put a lot of time into um, kind of rolling this program out and any expansion of this kind of an effort would definitely need more hands on deck. And so look forward to um, reading the report and hearing more about how the experience was for the young, the young people who are involved and hope we can continue to think about how we can expand this further in the county. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to the next item, which is item eight, a presentation of the 2023 California fire season by Fire Chief Nate Armstrong as outlined in the memo of the Director of General Services. We have the agenda board memo and we have our Chief Armstrong here. Welcome back. Uh, Good to see you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chair Friends, Supervisors, Mr. Palacios. Thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, stated, I'm Nate Armstrong. I'm the uh, unit chief of the Cal Fire San Mateo Santa Cruz unit and also uh, by contract, the fire chief of your Santa Cruz County Fire Department. Uh, Going to kind of dance both sides of the line here a little bit this morning and give just a brief update on the County Fire Department and then um, dip into a little bit of what to expect out of the coming months from the Cal Fire side. Yeah. All right, um, so just a brief review of the Santa Cruz County Fire Department. This is actually the 75th year of a cooperative agreement between uh, Santa Cruz County and Cal Fire to provide the services uh, to Santa Cruz County. Uh, 
a uh, brief snapshot of that is uh, that we provide a uh, year round fire marshal and training services, as well as dispatch services through Cal Fire staff uh, to the Santa Cruz County Fire Department. We also administer uh, the five volunteer companies spread throughout the county. And those companies are uh, the areas of Las Cumbres, Bonnie Dune, Loma Prieta, uh, Davenport, and Corlitos. We have we seem to struggle. We hover around uh, 60 to 70 volunteers. So it's been a long time hope to get that number up. However, uh, just with today's times, it seems like those numbers continue to wane. And, and today, as we sit, we're at about 65 uh, volunteers countywide for Santa Cruz County Fire. And then in the, uh, in the I call it the non-peak fire season month, so it, what most would call winter, uh, we, uh, Santa Cruz County funds to keep several fire engines, uh, CAL FIRE engines staffed uh, throughout the county to continue providing those services that CAL FIRE provides in the fire season. And then uh, just a brief note on the uh, most recent contract renewal with CAL FIRE. Uh, this board recently approved a one-year uh, contract renewal and a couple of changes to that uh, uh, renewal this year. Major step forward added some full-time staffing positions, and that will allow uh, CAL FIRE to be able to maintain that Amador staffing in the winter and also kind of redirected a couple of positions uh, to create a position that will be focused on uh, planning and implementing fuel reduction projects in the county fire area. <clears throat> a little bit on mobile equipment replacement. This has all been made possible from the 2020 uh, ballot measure by CSA 48. Um, one of the major initiatives of that was to replace the aging fleet. So I outlined a couple of those uh, recent advancements here that have happened since this last fall. Uh, we got uh, two new type one engines, which most people think of as like the city fire engines. And those went to the communities of Coralitos and Davenport, as well as uh, the sister engine to those uh, identical uh, went to the Pajaro Dunes community, which is technically part of county fires, self-funded under CSA 4. Uh, we uh, received and put into service two new rescue vehicles for the communities of Coralitos and Davenport. Those are basically a heavy duty truck with a lot of compartments and rescue equipment. They require a, a lower level license. And so a lot of more of our volunteers are able to respond those to the non-fire calls, such as medical aids, uh, vehicle accidents, and so forth. We do have a new water tender uh, that is here in Santa Cruz County. We're just waiting for a little bit of warranty work from the manufacturer on that, and then that'll be going into place in Bonnie Dune, and then a couple of new staff vehicles for our fire marshal and our training captain. A couple more uh, vehicles that are already on order. We've had uh, three new uh, Type 3 engines, which are the wildland uh, kind of style engines that most people think of. Uh, those have been on order, uh, two of them since 2021 and another one since last year. We're looking at about three-year delivery times on new fire engines right now, so really having to, to plan ahead. Uh, and then a couple more staff vehicles, as well as one new Type 1 engine budgeted for this year. Uh, like I say, this was all made possible by that ballot measure in 2020. Uh, this year, putting seven new vehicles into service, we are able to surplus a total of 12 um, aged vehicles that had an average uh, age of 25 years old. So kind of a big step forward in modernizing the fleet. Uh, moving into the master plan. So County Fire has long had a master plan. It is uh, the primary responsible of the Fire Department Advisory Commission to uh, write and update that plan. That plan was last updated in 2012 and was a three-year plan. So uh, this past year in 2022, Cal Fire and General Services staff started working with a couple of members of that FDAC to try to update that plan. And it just seemed like a bigger lift uh, than a couple of internal folks could do. Uh, we were looking for a more robust and uh, more involved plan. So we, uh, we contracted with a firm by the name of AP Triton. Uh, they have been doing a very in-depth analysis of everything from training standards, to staffing standards, response time standards, et cetera. And that we'll be getting a very objective uh, a third party report. I put uh, late summer or early fall, but realistically, we're hoping for that within a couple of weeks, we would really hope uh, to be moving forward. And that'll kind of help us as a roadmap um, for future planning for the county fire. A quick update on the fire marshal's office. 
uh, as a result of the tragic uh, ghost ship fire of 2016 and all the, the loss of life there, there was uh, state legislation that mandates certain occupancies be uh, inspected annually by the fire department having jurisdiction. Uh, part of that legislation mandates that it be reported to uh, the governing board. So uh, for 2022, uh, county fire area, CSA 48, has 22 of those types of occupancies, and CSA 4, or Pajaro Dunes, has three. And those types of occupancies are, are high-volume occupancies, like jails, uh, care facilities, hotels, uh, multi, multi-residential type facilities. And we did inspect 100% of those occupancies in 2022 and will again in 2023. Uh, aside from those types of inspections, we do have standard business type inspections that our uh, our engine companies go out and perform. Our goal is to do half of those every year in the jurisdiction. So on a two-year cycle, we'll complete 100%. And in 2022, we did complete 67 of 79 of those, a rate of 84%. So we're a little overzealous there, but we'll we'll hit that mark again this year. Uh, we continue to work. Our fire marshal's office continues to be very busy uh, working on rebuilds. Uh, in the 2020 uh, CZU August Lightning uh, Complex footprint. Uh, much thanks to uh, community, community development instru- infrastructure, as well as uh, this board for continuing that contract with the vendor um, for uh, more streamlining of that, of that process. It decreases our uh, a lot of the workload on the individual offices. And then, uh, like I mentioned in uh, the contract, we were able to eliminate a couple of uh, two uh, positions in the fire marshal's office this year that happened just through attrition from retirements. Um, And what we'll be able to do is increase efficiency by contracting some of those plan check services out to a third party vendor. And that allowed us to hire um, that fuel reduction uh, position, which we're working on hiring right now. Uh, Segwaying into a little bit of county fire, a little bit of Cal fire. This is a great, uh, great example of uh, cooperative fire protection. And uh, the photo you're seeing is a tracked chipper. Uh, the acquisition of that chipper with Cal Fire funds was recently approved by this board. Uh, we haven't received it yet. It's still on order. Uh, but what that'll do is allow us to um, move that chipper back into wooded areas where we would normally have to drag a lot of material out to the roads to chip or leave it in place. And then we do this dance every spring of trying to burn all these piles before it gets too hot and everything. So that's just another tool in the tool chest that'll allow us um, to meet fuel reduction needs in the community. Uh, Moving more onto the Cal Fire side, um, this is just a look at historical uh, fire ignitions within the county and I'll also talk about it on the statewide level. So Cal Fire's major operational objective is to keep 95% of fires to 10 acres or less. And by and large, we do a really great job of that. Uh, In 2022, uh, there were 112 vegetation fires, and this is um, this is solely in the state responsibility area. We also Cal Fire also responds outside into local jurisdictions like the city of Watsonville or Santa Cruz City, where they have primary uh, jurisdiction for wildland fires. But this is solely for uh, state responsibility area. So we had 112 vegetation fires in the two counties uh, for a total of 92.8 acres. Uh, that brings that average obviously way down. of the fires that we responded to uh, were kept to that 10 acres or less. And the largest fire that we happened to have in 2022 was uh, in the county of San Mateo on a 100 degree day in June, and that was at 29 acres. Uh, Year to date so far, sorry, as of yesterday morning in Santa Cruz County, we have had 16 vegetation fires for a whopping total of 1.68 acres. So, so far uh, uh, this year, obviously meeting that uh, meeting that objective, although things are starting to get warmer and activity starting to pick up. So looking back at some prior years, I won't delve uh, really deep into this, but this is just a look at the past uh, seven or eight years. Like I just went over the 2022 stats and you can see that by and large, uh, we do get a fair amount of vegetation fires in the county. Uh, Most people just don't usually notice them because they aren't the very large scale, very noticeable. You can see the average fire size as the years go along that bottom row there, Um, typically about in the one, but usually less than than, uh, five acres as an average. 
And then we had a couple of anomaly years there between 2017 and 2020, where that average obviously comes way up by uh, one large devastating fire. Uh, either way, um, either way you look at it, um, we're still uh, generally meeting that 95% uh, goal of 10 acres or less and keeping them pretty small in the county. On a state and region wide uh, look, uh, this is just the last couple of years, as well as a uh, look at the five-year average uh, state and region-wide, or sorry, statewide for the five-year average. Again, uh, this is representative of kind of the, the long wet winter that we all had. We didn't, it wasn't just Santa Cruz County. It was obviously statewide. And so you're starting to see a very slow uh, transition into the peak fire year here um, as we come into August. I put a uh, asterisk next to that. Uh, 95,000 acres so far in 2023. Uh, that was a result of last week when these stats were pulled, there was a 75,000 acre fire in federal protection area in the desert of California along the Nevada border, not near a populated area or anything. So aside from that fire, which we include in the total, if it hadn't been for that, you'd see that we'd only be at about 20 or 30,000 acres right now statewide, which is pretty impressive for the beginning of August. And again, representative of that wet winter and the real slow buildup. Um, but again, um, similar to the local pattern, we're seeing fewer fires generally for fewer acres uh, region-wide and across the state. Uh, that is starting to pick up quite a bit. We saw things start to heat up this last week um, across uh, large areas. Uh, we're starting to see the grass crops really starting to cure out in the areas that have a lot of grass like Kern County, the front country of Fresno County and so forth. You're really starting to see a lot more ignitions and a little more difficulty in containing those fires. But uh, so far yet to have any uh, truly major incidents in the state. Uh, looking at uh, CAL FIRE's aviation assets, everybody always wants to know about aircraft. So uh, CAL FIRE does have the largest civil firefighting air force in the world. Um, and that's been a long stance on uh, federal excess uh, equipment. So from our fixed wing aircraft, the, the air attacks and the, uh, the old sub hunter planes that we use as air tankers to the, to the uh, Vietnam era uh, Bell helicopters that we've been utilizing forever. Uh, we're starting to transition those into a little bit more of a modern fleet. So the daily staffing across the state as far as aircraft goes in the in the peak fire year is 11 helicopters, 13 air attacks, and 22 air tankers. Uh, both of these photos on the on the presentation were taken during last year's uh, De La Viega fire. We had one of each of the types of helicopters on that. So in the upper left there, you see that Bell helicopter. Those uh, held anywhere from 250 to 300 gallons of water. There's only one or two of those left front line in the state. Those should be transitioning to the newer aircraft, which you see in the lower right this year. And that's the uh, Sikorsky S-70I, which most people in the military world known as a Black Hawk, we call it a Fire Hawk. Um, so those are holding up to a thousand gallons of water. It's a lot faster, can carry a heavier, a, a larger crew. And um, the local uh, helicopter that services this area over next to Lexington Reservoir is in one of those newer aircraft already. Uh, so like I say, we should continue that transition this year with the last two helicopters. And the other thing that we're working on is transitioning seven federal excess uh, C-130 aircraft into uh, retardant dropping tankers for CAL FIRE. That's been a, about a three or four year uh, uh, project at this point, but hopefully moving forward a little quicker uh, soon. Another uh, piece on aircraft um, that's been uh, utilized by CAL FIRE for a couple of years now and seems to be bolstering a little bit each year is the use of exclusive use uh, aircraft. And what that is, is CAL FIRE contracts with these uh, private contractors um, and have them basically on retainers so that they can't be used, uh, can't contract out and go to other uh, fires throughout the nation and so forth. So they're uh, we dispatch them just like CAL FIRE aircraft. They're always available to us in, the, in that period that they're contracted. It's a pretty significant investment, um, and we've seen a lot of success with this aircraft. So uh, for 2023, there's 18 uh, water-dropping helicopters statewide. Um, 13 of the 18 of those carry 2,000-plus gallons of water, so a whole lot of water uh, being delivered to the fire. Uh, the closest ones to uh, Santa Cruz County or out of uh, small airports in Napa and Sonoma County. 
uh, but that doesn't mean they can't get here real quick. Uh, the photo on the slide here was taken on that large, that 29 acre fire in San Mateo that I mentioned last year. And all told, everybody said that uh, the, the use of both of those aircraft played a huge role in stopping that from uh, damaging any structures. Um, I am saddened to report uh, that uh, two days ago in the Riverside unit uh, of CAL FIRE, uh, two of these exclusive use aircraft uh, fighting a small vegetation fire did have a midair collision. And um, that collision ended in the loss of life of two CAL FIRE personnel as, one as, as well as the one contract uh, helicopter pilot. So tragic loss of those uh, three individuals, uh, of their families, and um, to the firefighting community in general. Um, so like I said, everybody always wants to know about aircraft and um, we appreciate the aircraft. They're absolutely great at um, keeping fires small, but uh, I've never seen a fire completely put out with aircraft. It all comes down to the folks on the ground and there's uh, no more unsung heroes, I don't think, than our hand crews. Uh, they do the least glamorous work. Um, and we've been challenged since 2020 to keep our hand crew numbers what they need to be. Uh, historically, through our relationship with the California Department of Corrections, we had 196 uh, hand crews funded statewide due to different changes throughout the uh, COVID pandemic and so forth. They've struggled to keep those numbers up. So many of those or several of the camps were defunded um and repurposed so we now have 152 of those cdcr hand crews um funded statewide but still struggling to keep those numbers up so as of today uh 72 of the 152 crews are staffed statewide and only 61 of those have enough folks on them to actually respond to a fire because we have a, a minimum for safety what that's done is forced um an adaptation that seems to change a little bit every year as uh we roll with the punches um, and that's been bolstering other programs within CAL FIRE. So partnerships with the California Conservation Corps, uh, we now have 32 of those crews funded statewide. Um, 29 of them as of today are staffed. Some of them are just uh, um, transitioning because they're losing some of their folks to CAL FIRE and so forth. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic, but uh, the photo on the slide here is of the... Um, is of our own 3C crew out of the Watsonville Work Center, Monterey Bay Crew One. And I truly believe, and we've been told by a lot of external folks, that is probably the absolute best 3C hand crew in the state. They've done an absolute phenomenal job. And a lot of it has to do with our local captain out of the city of Watsonville there, um, Cal Fire employee, Captain Rich Switzer. So he's built a fantastic crew. Um, they're doing a great job for the community. We also now have uh, 35 uh, crews staffed with just CAL FIRE personnel, um, CAL FIRE firefighters, which has been a change. Um, and then 14 crews that we have in partnership with um, the California Military Department and also what many folks probably know as the National Guard. So continuing to adapt to those needs um, and we're hoping always that those numbers start to come up a little bit. And then moving into, uh, as we come to an end here, uh, other things that CAL FIRE is uh, happening to do is a lot of investments in technology right now. Uh, a whole lot that aren't public yet or, or, or maybe not for um, need few further development, but a couple of things that are already out there is this um, continued investment in the Alert California system. This was previously known as Alert Wildfire. Now it's Alert California. Um, over the last four years, CAL FIRE has put close to $20 million into this system have hundreds of cameras statewide helping to detect uh, fires early and uh, investing another about three and a half million dollars this year piloting artificial intelligence so that um, the computers can uh, detect without a uh, human eye. So working on that this year, as well as continuing the partnership with um, Cal OES for the Firus program. And what that is, there's a snapshot of one of the products there on the screen. It's a couple of aircraft that uh, fly at a very high altitude. They're available all year long statewide and they respond to fires with um, super high definition cameras, infrared capabilities and so forth, as well as some um, uh, fire modeling software. So we're getting real time data, whether it be video or projections uh, like the one you see here straight to our cell phones uh, um, as we're responding to vegetation fires that they happen to be over. 
So exciting things happening with technology. And then as far as fire prevention goes, uh, we have a lot of different grant programs. One of the major ones that happens is these CAL FIRE prevention grants. There seems to be multiple um, kind of rollouts a year. The most recent one awarded 96 projects uh, statewide for $113 million. Um, seven of those 96 projects happen to be right here in San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. I think five of them were in Santa Cruz for a total of $3.5 million. And a big reason for that is uh, we don't have all the people to do all of the fire prevention projects year round. It's just fire prevention needs are outpacing our operations folks, the folks on the fire engines, the hand crews. And so this has been a major push over the last few years is to inject that money into the local communities, into the RCDs, the sorry, the resource conservation districts, fire safe councils, firewise communities, all of them. And locally, we've done a uh, we've had a really great opportunity with a lot of our local partners. Uh, to make those projects happen. All right, so as far as local conditions go, uh, like I said, we're we're very similar to the rest of the state. Everybody got had a very wet winter. A couple of things that we saw out of that huge grass crop. Um, and Santa Cruz County, I know there's we do have areas that are grassy, but not like these huge swaths of the grass like in the Central Valley and so forth. We are starting to see an uptick in the grass fires that we're getting, like particularly in South County, we've been responding quite a bit more this last week as, uh, as those grasses cure out. But the pictures here are uh, representative of what a result of the winter. And what that means to us on a fire protection side is a lot of blocked roads. We're out there trying to clear them. Um, the folks, um, uh, our county roads folks are doing a great job of prioritizing those and um, helping get us to areas that we need to be able to get to within the county. Uh, we're out repairing fire roads and so forth. That middle picture is what worries me for future years. Um, that is what we are seeing all over the woods and the streams and everything else throughout the county is a ton of dead and down material as a result of the winter storms. Uh, I don't think personally that it'll we'll see a huge impact from it this year as most of that material is going to take at least a season to cure and really dry. But this next fire season, we could be looking at a large amount of accumulated dead uh, mass on the forest floors and looking at a large fire problem with that. So uh, as a whole, I believe we're looking, we already are looking at a little bit later of a peak to the fire year, which has been a good um, rest and able to work through some of these access type issues. I do expect to see kind of what we would have seen in years past, like with 2017, 18, in those years where we don't start to see a whole lot of fires within Santa Cruz County until those fall months of September, maybe early October and so forth, and kind of more representative of what a lot of folks got uh, pretty used to for a long time in the county. And then finally, uh, sorry to end on a somber note, but uh, just need to spend just a moment to recognize um, the loss of Daniel Lamoth. On uh, February 19th, uh, Daniel Lamoth, who was a very popular young man in Santa Cruz County, uh, was wanting to uh, become a volunteer firefighter to serve the community that he grew up in uh, and potentially move on to a full-time career as a firefighter uh, was uh, participating in his initial training to be a Santa Cruz County volunteer, uh, had a medical emergency while participating in that training, and we were unable to um, revive Daniel. So he succumbed to his injuries at, or sorry, his medical condition at uh, the young age of 38. And it's just a a stark reminder of the folks that uh, take the leap to serve their community and and train to be ready for those um, for those emergencies and just the sacrifices made. So again, sorry to end on a, a somber note, but just want to remember Daniel Lamont and available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Chief, for the presentation. Thank you for taking the time to honor your fallen colleagues in Southern California as well as Daniel. We appreciate. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions from my colleagues, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chief Armstrong and uh, our General Services Director, Michael Beaton, for your work uh, and CAL FIRE for funding um, the Resource Conservation District's Shaded Fuel Break. That's going to be uh, 
do a lot to protect Scotts Valley and the San Ramon Valley. Um, and thank you also to the RCDs, the Regional Conservation District's uh, Neighborhood Chipping Program. Uh, I have a question, maybe it's for uh, um, Mr. Beaton. Uh, when do you anticipate that LAPCO um, its study will conclude on the annexation potential of uh, county fire service areas? Uh, thank you, Supervisor uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. Uh, we are currently meeting with LAFCO on a almost a bi-weekly basis, trying to go through and understand when we're having the consultant, who's also the same consultant that we're using for our county fire master plan, uh, AP Triton. Uh, we did have a discussion with AP Triton very recently that they're really close on the LAFCO study and making a recommendation, or at least having the results and findings. So I'm hoping that within the next month or so, we should have something fairly um, for us to look at uh, from AP Triton on both the County Fire Master Plan side as well as the LAPCO study. Uh, but my guess would be about a month. About. And when it's available, the board, we can expect to see it then a month later than that, or is it going to be months later than that? Uh, I would have to defer over to LAFCO. I'm not exactly positive on their, their side. I know they probably go to the LAFCO commission first, uh, and then from there, depending on what the results are, would ultimately come to the board here. Thank you. Supervisor Conan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Chief Armstrong. Um, well, of course, uh, it's some of the, the new and exciting toys that uh, are, are cool to learn about, like the track chipper and the firehawks. Uh, as you pointed out, the real core part of our, our fire response comes down to the, the people. And uh, in particular, I continue to be concerned about the um, lack of hand crews that are available to respond uh, to fires. Um, first question is, is our own Ben Lomond Conservation Camp, which uh, houses fire crews, are they one of the fire ready groups? Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, so our Ben Lomond Camp is a good example. Like I said, we're, we're down statewide. That Ben Lomond Camp is funded for five mm -hmm. crews and we're running two crews out of there right now. The promising piece of that is as of this morning, those crews are completely full. And so if we get an influx of a couple more um, inmate firefighters, we should be able to switch to grant those crews be smaller, but we would be able to field three of them. And we kind of go back and forth based on the numbers that we have between two and three crews. So they are still there, just not at full capacity and haven't been since 2020. Got it. Uh, and I know that conservation camp program is a collaboration, of course, with the Department of Corrections. And I think you know, one of the big reasons we're seeing so many uh, fewer folks in those programs is, of course, because we have, I think, 20,000 vacant uh, prison beds in the state, which um, as a result of realignment, um, so there's just less people that are eligible to enter the programs. Is there any discussion within CAL FIRE of I mean, changing the eligibility for some of the programs? I mean, so that, you know, maybe even just some specific camps are um, you know, not for people that have necessarily, you know, coming straight from the prisons, but, um, you know, maybe we're just referred uh, as part of a, you know, potential substance use um, program. I mean, these these camps do offer an, a range of rehabilitative services. I mean, just looking at the Ben Lomond Conservation Camp page now, uh, they talk about, um, you know, the fact that they offer educational services, substance abuse programs, religious programs, hobby craft, and GED and college courses. So it seems like um, there's a good fit there. And then, of course, um, there's a lot of great things about the programs that really do help um, people rehabilitate. I just did the sense of purpose and serving their community. I've heard, you know, firsthand testimonials from people who have been through these programs that said, you know, I basically went from a, a zero, a menace to society to a hero, uh, saving small towns from fire. Um, so it just seems like we've got to find a way uh, to to make bring these programs back and serve more people. I'm just wondering what the state of the conversation is within CAL FIRE. Sure, and, and thank you again for the question. To answer the question shortly, yes, those conversations are being had uh, to be a lot longer. Uh, all of it's in partnership with uh, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. So any of those changes are driven by both. Um, there are other opportunities there. One example is the Ventura um, facility that was created a few years ago. Uh, and that is exactly what you're talking about. It's basically like a step down, um, not being an inmate um, incarcerated uh, camp, but for folks that were recently paroled and want to rehabilitate into a more fruitful career. And so that is a good example of exactly what you're asking for. And I 
I can't tell you if that's in the, the tea leaves to continue or not, but uh, would hope to see anything that can bolster our numbers. Was that program driven by the specific conservation camp or was sort of a pilot for the program as a whole? I honestly couldn't tell you, but okay. I'll definitely find out. All right, thanks. Good to know. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. You mentioned and there was a slide too. You mentioned that there was debris from the winter storms. Uh, do we still have so significant amounts of debris of like wood and the wood chips that we have? Is that enough to bring down the, the and start planning for that too? To that's the kind of a million dollar question, and that goes back to partnering with a lot of the local agencies. Like I said, we we don't have the the person power to go out and take care of all of that material, and we tend to focus more around. Um, populated communities and so forth, although all of it's obviously an issue. Uh, so pardon the pun, but we'll start to chip away at it. Um, and we're going to, we're going to do everything that we can through different alternative programs and so forth. The hard part is constantly for us that the same folks that are on the fire engines, fighting the fires and everything and doing defensible space inspections around homes and everything are the same bodies that we have to do the fire prevention projects. So that's, why it's so important to involve the communities and try to get those um, those other uh, partners involved in the in the fuel reduction. Sounds like a burning issue. Yes. Thank you for matching my pun. Um, Supervisor Cummings, please. Well, I just want to start by thanking you for that presentation. Um, and I think you touched on a couple topics that I'd like to bring up right now. But um, you know, identifying the fact that you know, the inmate crews are declining and just given the impacts of the community faced after the 2020 fires, I know that there's a lot of interest in folks who live, for example, in Bonnie Dune and potentially within Supervisor McPherson's district who really want to volunteer and get involved, but it seems like the criteria for volunteering is pretty high. And so I'm just wondering if there's any discussions at CAL FIRE around reducing those criteria for participating in the, as a volunteer firefighter um, to encourage more people to apply and, and get more people, get more you know bodies out there who can help in these efforts. Great. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, in short, yes, the, the, the difficult part of we're asked all the time to decrease the training standards and decrease the training standards or training requirements. Um, and we have, we have brought those down to the minimum that are acceptable from, I would say, a liability perspective of keeping people safe. It's an extremely hazardous job. Um, and yeah, we, we have to have a minimum. Some of the things that have been brought forward is to have people do a one weekend training kind of seminar thing and never, never again. And not a single one of us would be comfortable putting those people in an emergency situation. One thing that we've been uh, looking at is partnering with the volunteer center here with uh, Santa Cruz County and looking at non-emergency response type volunteer positions. So don't want to jump too far ahead in it, but one of the things that we've looked at is, is there a possibility there for folks to volunteer in like a fuel reduction capacity? Um, the one thing I constantly go back to is it's hard work and it's hard getting people to volunteer to do that hard work, but we're, we're going to give it our best effort and see if we can't, uh, if there's not a place there to get some extra labor, if you will, and extra effort out doing that fuel reduction work. Great. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was thinking to as well. You know, there's firefighting, but then there's also vegetation reduction and hand crews, maybe a different skill set that if, um, people had the opportunity to participate in one of those different capacities and not have to be trained to the standards of a firefighter, then absolutely a lot of people will be interested in participating. Um, just as a comment, I think it would be great for future presentations if there's any way we can quantify or get information on uh, vegetation management. I think it'd be just really good, great to include that because um, seeing the fires are down is encouraging but then we also know that living in a landscape that's adapted to fire that it is a necessary thing that we need to have in our ecosystem and so either we have prescribed burns or, or fires that are occurring or we're trying to mitigate the biomass that accumulates so that we don't have um, too much biomass accumulating that leads to really intense fires so i think it'd be helpful to have some info on that in future presentations um, and then i just just for, out of personal curiosity, I'm just wondering um, kind of where CAL FIRE is at in terms of expanding the use and application of drones 
to help in firefighting efforts. And that is definitely one of the pieces of technology. Sorry for not going deeper into it. Uh, we have a, a group of folks throughout the state. We have a handful that are trained. I think we have approximately 20 that are trained to fly drones on fires with other aircraft, um, which is a big step forward. We're using those mostly right now for reconnaissance, especially during the evening hours when there's less, if any, aircraft flying. But we've also uh, begun to utilize those in a couple of instances uh, on partner fires for uh, fire or prescribed fire or firing operations on emergency on actual incidents. So uh, the use is out there. I would say the uh, study is being or studies are being expanded for a lot wider use. Um, it's one of the things that we're embracing. Great. And then just a, a final comment or an ask is that if there's any funding opportunities, please keep us um, in mind and let us know. I know that we were just at uh, the California State Association of Counties Conference and there was a, a county, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but they um, had created a similar um, office to our OR3 and had coordinated with the, the different fire safe councils throughout their county and the different volunteer firefighting organizations that were able to receive, I think it was like $24 million grant to go towards um, vegetation management. And so if there's opportunities for us to be able to create those same kind of collaborations and, and organize around um, how we can um, strategically move together on this effort to be able to apply and qualify for funding, I think it'd be great for us to be aware of those opportunities. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our community, as you know, Chief went from historic drought and unprecedented fires to biblical floods in a matter of months. And it's not a question of if we're gonna have another one of these natural disasters, but when I think that the uh, master plan and study and looking at the state of all of the fire agencies within Santa Cruz County is an important step in seeing whether or not we're best prepared to respond uh, in our current structure. I think that realistically, the answer to that is that it's unlikely, and I, but I think that uh, uh, it'll be important to see what comes to LAFCO and then comes back to this board for consideration. I think that you and your team are doing uh, remarkable work with, with very little, uh, both within the region and, and, and across the state. Uh, and you tend to go into some of the most challenging environments first. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge you and your team as evidenced by what just happened down in Southern California. As a reminder uh, that when you are, uh, it's different on the wildland versus the urban response. And the dangers aren't the same. Uh, the rural residents across our state, they'll rely on you for uh, life and property safety in ways that uh, that are essential. And so I wanted to make sure that, that you also know that the board, so many of us represent so much of, of the rural areas, really do appreciate your work. And I think that we have a responsibility and then just looking from a structural standpoint as to whether or not uh, the current structure in our county is the best way to respond to rural residents and all residents. And so I'm looking forward to that study, but thank you for your presentation and this work. Um, this is a non-action item, but we'll open it up to the community because it is an item that the board received a presentation on if anybody would like to make any comments. Good morning and welcome back. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is James Ewing Whitman, Nate Armstrong. That was an excellent presentation with a lot of information and brevity. You people should hear what you said. You said a lot of important stuff. <laughs> Although I could make many comments, I will say that I didn't have the time to look through any attend notebooks like this. Uh, my favorite storage media, I recently lost act access to over 9,000 presentations, where 316 of those presentations of at least 10 each were Leo and youth. The reason I'm bringing it up and it wasn't brought up is public safety is really important. There were several presentations about patented um, fire prevention devices that were actually uh, acoustical tools rather than acoustical weapons. You know, from memory, these things weren't much bigger than a five gallon bucket and they contained a 10 inch woofer. In my memory, it was about 58 Hertz, one frequency and the other one was about 160 Hertz. They were putting out fires within 10 feet of them and from hundreds of feet away with very little electrical energy. So I'm inviting anyone to look at that research. I know I could probably find it on someone else's computer, but um, I guess that's a thank you for being uh, 
at the top of some lists. Once again, Mr. Armstrong, that was a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Did anybody else like to address this in chambers? Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm going to address the board of the Santa Cruz County Fire Department. You are the directors of the board for this fire department. And I, I wish you would note that on your agendas that you are accepting these reports, considering the budgets as the board of directors of the Santa Cruz County Fire Department. I'm, I'm pleased to see this information. I wondered why the county fire budget was on the consent agenda during budget times. Don't do that again. It is should be elevated to any other public safety issue, just as you did all law enforcement on a regular agenda on the budget. I also want to bring to your attention what was not mentioned that uh, the res Resource Conservation District recently released an updated version of Living with Fire in Santa Cruz County for residents that's excellent. And for the first time talks about the use of good fire. It's an excellent publication. Um, I also would like to ask that your board of directors look into the use of Komodo fire prevention material. It is non-toxic. It does not contain PFAS, which is a huge concern in our watersheds now. It is a carcinogen and the cancer deaths in our firefighters is abnormally high, possibly linked to PFAS. So Komodo fire prevention is uh, plant-based and has been registered with the EPA. Please look into our county using it instead of PFAS. May I have one more minute, please? Just please finish up. Thank you. I have a few things. Um, um, recently, County Fire hired full-time a, a battalion chief for training who came from Cal Fire ranks. It, that person could have come from the volunteer fire captain ranks and should have, in my opinion. I also um, want to say that they are, the uh, fuel reduction planner should be working with the County Fire Safe Council who is in direct contact with the RCD and the fire wise communities in our county. And we could be putting in place to bolster fuel reduction work, uh, something that Scotts Valley has done, the the brush brigade that goes out with high school seniors that need volunteer hours and they help senior citizens and disabled people create the, the required and very important fire defensible space around their homes. We need to be doing that countywide. Um, the track chipper that uh, Chief Armstrong mentioned was a grant that was given to county fire department, Thank you, Mr. but it should be Thank you, Ms. Tybrunner. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Ms. Steinbrenner, you, you requested, Ms. Steinbrenner, you requested an additional minute. You were given an additional minute. Can you just, I mean, just show the respect for what you asked for and you were honored it, okay? So just respect the body in the same way the body is respecting you. Ms. Steinbrenner, please. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Is there anybody online? Yes, we have speakers online. Thank you. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Yeah. Marilyn Garrett, I sympathize with the courage and the difficult extreme obstacles firefighters are facing, and we need you to be in top health. I also appreciate Becky Steinbrenner's research. I just learned something about this Komodo fire prevention non-toxic method that should definitely be looked into. What are some of the causal factors 
in these just really, um, you know, extreme uh, weather fluctuations. So I'm going to refer people to geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington and a few quotes that climate engineering, he said, has derailed the hydraulic cycle. The nanoparticles in climate engineering are desiccants. Ocean temperatures are like hot tub levels. Oxygen levels are plummeting. Uh, more power plants are going into a meltdown mode. Uh, bees are dying of massive aluminum exposure from the nanoparticles. So these fires are related to these kind of aberrations. Additionally, we need you firefighters to be in top health uh, conditions to be able to perform your responsibilities. And I refer you to um, Susan Foster, and I'll put this in the mail to you. She organized a brain study of firefighters, men who are considered, of course, to be the strongest of the strong among us in California in 2000. There are no further speakers. Okay, this is a non action item. Thank you, Chief, for the presentation. We do appreciate it. We'll move on to the next item of the regular agenda, which is item nine to consider a presentation and update on County of Santa Cruz membership in the American Association of Retired Persons Network of Age Friendly States and Communities as outlined in the memo of the Director of Human Services. We have the agenda board memo item, the presentation, as well as a strike on underlying element of the membership acceptance. Um, my understanding is that Mr. Morris is available, but he's available uh, virtually, correct? Is he kicking it off? Or Ms. Morales, are you kicking it off? All right, I think your mic is off. I push. How's that? Perfect. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. I am Alicia Morales. I'm the director of the Adult and Long-Term Care Division in the Human Services Department. And today I am joined. I'm Clay Kemp and I'm here as executive director of the Seniors Council and in the capacity of being the, um, that organization being the Area Agency on Aging for Santa Cruz and San Benito counties. Mr. Kemp and I are very happy to be here today to provide an update to your board from the May 26, 2023 meeting where your board approved the request for the county to apply and join the AARP network of age-friendly communities. Thank you. Today, we will give a brief overview of the AARP network of age-friendly states and communities and the California Master Plan on Aging to highlight how these two initiatives complement each other. We will also cover some factors that pose unique challenges in our community that underscores the need for us to create an age-friendly Santa Cruz County. We will then briefly update your board on the work that we are doing, and then we'll have an opportunity for to answer questions and collect feedback. Oh. Thank you. So just to give a brief background, in 2010, the World Health Organization established the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities to connect communities worldwide with the common vision of maximizing the contribution of older people in communities and improving the quality of life for all people as they age. In 2012, the American Association of Retired Persons, or AARP, established uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> became the only independent affiliate in the U.S. under the World Health Organization Age-Friendly Initiative. Membership into AARP's age-friendly states and communities means the community, including elected officials, has made a commitment to actively work towards making the community a great place to live for people of all ages. In June 
2019, your board directed the county in collaboration with Seniors Council to apply to AARP. This effort was delayed due to COVID. Then on May 26, 2023, your board authorized applying to the Age-Friendly Network. We have since applied and been formally accepted. Yay! <laughs> we join a network that includes 12 states, including California, which joined in 2021, and over 771 communities nationwide, representing 100 million people. This also includes the city of Watsonville, which joined in 2022, and the city of Santa Cruz, which is in the process of applying. AARP's age-friendly communities framework is centered around eight domains of livability that influence the quality of life of older adults. Age-friendly communities are inclusive and considerate of the perspectives of all residents. Communities also have the option to add additional domains based upon their local needs. We intend to add emergency preparedness and elder justice to our domains to create 10 for Santa Cruz County. To create an age-friendly community requires commitment from all sectors, public and private, and goes well beyond health and human services. So before I jump to master plan for aging, I, I just really want to thank the board for endorsing age friendly. And I especially want to call out supervisors McPherson and friend who are early champions of this way back in 2018, I think before it long before it became uh, came to the board. And at that same time, uh, supervisor Hernandez was a champion in the city of Watsonville. So thank all of you for your leadership. And, and I'll just add uh, that uh, supervisor coming staff um, in the city of Santa Cruz was a huge champion and really significant in getting us where we are. So the mass, the master plan for aging plays nicely into age friendly communities. And the background on master plan for aging is uh, aging leaders around the state, particularly led by the SCAN Foundation, challenged the gubernatorial candidates in the last uh, election, the one that uh, Governor Newsom eventually won to come up with some plan to address aging in California, given the population changes that we're seeing. So both candidates endorsed that, and the result was this creation actually of an extensive work group, which I was honored to be a member of, to put together what the master plan for aging for the state was. You can see on the slides that it was broken down into five bold goals, but those goals were the result of something like 800 individual um, outcomes that were suggested. So it was a really a large plan that we put forward and those still exist. And, and these are the categories they fit nicely into. I think one of the things that I love about this plan, and this was something that all the stakeholders were very committed in, is making this a dynamic plan that lives, not a plan that sits on a shelf. I mean, that's the last thing we need is another pretty plan that gathers dust. We wanted something that could be implemented and would, would become reality. So the whole plan is designed as that. It has these guidelines of what we do, but I think the most um, engaging piece of it is that there's an expectation and a whole guideline on how to create a local playbook for establishing these five bold goals. And that's what we're in, indulging in next. The other part of it, and, and there were a handful of us that championed this, is that if we achieve the goals of age-friendly communities, we get a very long way towards addressing all five of these master plan for aging goals, along with a number of the objectives. And the plan is playing out in a number of ways. It, it has elevated the discussion about older adults around the state, which makes it easy for advocates or easier, I don't wanna say it's easy, but much easier for advocates to get traction in terms of getting state dollars allocated to the growing population. And that's something that we've tried to do in leadership roles in Sacramento in the past couple of years is when we're targeting funding additions, tying them in directly with some of the objectives in master plan. And it's fascinating that now when I go and make those testi testimonies, 
the panelists and the committee members actually know what I'm talking about as to seeing that glazed look in the audience when, when you're up there. So the efforts, the multi-year efforts, and, and I think that's what this plan is, and it's achieving those sorts of goals. So um, a couple other things that we really tried to focus on was having practical solutions, things that we could do in reality, not just in writing and in theory. Um, we also made sure that we're acknowledging all populations in the community, making sure that equity and diversity were a key part of it, and also recognizing that services in a rural community versus suburban community versus an urban community are dramatically different. And representing Santa Cruz and San Benito counties, I was especially invested in seeing that happen. So I'm proud that we're there. Um, before we jump to the next slide in here, and, and you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about the data and growth of the population, but I think one of the things that we wanna emphasize, and I'll probably say this at the end too, is that this isn't a plan where any one entity can, can come up with the solutions. Government can't do this. Private industry can't do this alone. Nonprofits can't do it alone. But hopefully by bringing the entire community together in the partnership that we're doing right now with Age Friendly, we'll make a lot of progress towards getting there. So next slide, I guess I can do that. Yeah, thanks. So as Clay mentioned, the goal of these two complementary initiatives is to create a community that prevents that promotes healthy aging for all. It is an ambitious countywide effort and cannot be just a, a government initiative. We we are looking at transforming systems and services based upon the needs of our local community. And Santa Cruz in particular uh, is facing some unique challenges. If you look at the slide in front of you, the orange line represents uh, those ages 60 plus, and the blue line represents those aged zero to 17 years old. In the state of California, in, in the state of California, we are looking at one in four people being over the age of 60 by the year 2030. In Santa Cruz, we are looking at one in three. That is 30% of our population here over the age of 60. We also have the 11th highest income disparity in California with a ratio of 24 to one. Combine this with the fact that Santa Cruz County is now considered the most expensive rental market in the nation. And also the Central Coast region, about 20% of the doctors are age 65 or older, which means that when they retire, our doctor shortage will be sooner than the rest of the state with our fast growing senior population needing greater levels of care. This presents a public health challenge. All of these factors highlight the need to improve and expand systems that support aging. Yeah, and, and workforce development is just a huge challenge. As the population ages, that creates all kinds of economic and service delivery challenges. Um, one thing is that this, the, the old phrase was silver tsunami, right? Everybody has heard that. We've been hearing that for a decade. For a decade, we've been told that the crisis is coming. And the big fear was that one in every five five members of our society would be over the age of 60 and we're past that. So the crisis is now, the need is happening right now. We saw it really highlighted during the pandemic when seniors were hardest hit of any population and seniors living in long-term care facilities uh, died almost exponentially higher and were more isolated and harder hit than any other age group. The other thing about this that, that I wanna share is um, the figures that I've seen from the past decade show that the 65 to 84 population in Santa Cruz County have grown by over 80%, which is just an astronomical figure. And that is the highest and fastest growth rate in all of California. So perhaps more than any other county in the state, we're truly at the edge of this crisis. And I think this partnership we're talking about now um, shows that hopefully we can be held up as leaders in responding to it as well. 
And that leads to collaboration. Yes. So this effort must be collaborative and it requires the commitment from the highest levels of government as well as all other sectors. In February of 2022, the county leadership in collaboration with leadership from the four cities, seniors council and supervisory districts two and five started holding quarterly master plan for aging governance meetings. We agreed that the first place to start was to do a comprehensive community needs assessment to better understand the landscape of our systems in Santa Cruz and the needs of the community. Through engagement with the community, we've assembled a 10 member steering committee comprised of a diverse group of representation from older, the older adult community and community-based organizations that work with older adults. The steering committee is helping inform and create a culturally responsive community needs assessment that will roll out in early 2024. These steering committee members were carefully selected to actively assist in collecting feedback from underrepresented members of the community to ensure we capture all voices in this effort. The findings from this community needs assessment will be used to help us identify our local priorities, including system improvements and policy initiatives. This will help us develop an action plan towards becoming a more age-friendly community. And just a couple things to add on this. There's actually two needs assessments going on. So I mentioned that here just so there isn't confusion if people see both. Uh, for the first time, California is doing a statewide, statewide needs assessment of older adults. Historically, it's been done by our agency. The AAA, each AAA, and there's 33 of them around the state, conduct their own separate senior needs assessment. But this year with COVID funding, the state of California and California Department of Aging had enough resources that they decided they wanted to try for the first time doing a statewide survey, which is going to give us universal answers because every AAA was left independently to create their own survey. So we had 33 different surveys and you could not compare Santa Cruz County to Monterey County or Santa Clara County. So I think this will be really revealing. So if anybody sees a needs assessment right now, they're being distributed. So if you know somebody or hear somebody that has a, a needs assessment set sent from California Department of Aging, please encourage them to fill that out. And then the county needs assessment. We, we've worked together to make sure they're not happening at the same time. We want to see the results from the state needs assessment and then see if there's anything in particular we want to focus on or emphasize. And I think that ability will give us much better information in the long run. And it points to two entities or multiple entities working together and shows how we're trying very hard not to duplicate each other's efforts and to come up with something that lifts both of us a little bit higher. And again, it's just really exciting to uh, be part of that. I'll just wrap up by adding one more thing. Um, our agency was recently awarded a state grant to help develop master plan for aging on the local basis, the, that local playbook. We were going to do that anyway, but now we have a little more resources. So one thing you will be hearing about um, next year, next calendar year, is we will put together uh, another solution summit. We've done a few of these over the past couple decades where we bring the community together to take all this information we're talking about right now and see what we can come up with in terms of some action steps that will improve the condition of aging in our county. And thanks. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Are there any comments from board members before we open it up to the community? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Chair Friend. And I want to thank you, especially as a uh, supervisor for many years here, then uh, for partnering with, with me to, on proposing that we uh, consider becoming an age friend of the community back. It's five years ago, 2018. Uh, and thanks for the effort of everybody that's been involved in this. I'm especially impressed with the Human Services Department. And thank you, Ms. Morales. And uh, the staff who worked hard to make this become a reality uh, for a local playbook uh, for the state's master plan on aging. We've just seen how comparatively, how quickly our age, commu aged community is increasing in uh, in this county compared to the rest of the state. 
And our, our county, I think it's to its credit, is, is partnered with the four cities, as you had mentioned, uh, in the area aging on the aging. And thank you, Mr. Kemp, for being there forever. Uh, and uh, for the community-based organizations that serve our seniors. Um, so we can really develop a, a playbook of what we should do. And this is going to be coming soon. But uh, I look forward to hearing more about the outcomes of this good work uh, in early 2024, when we can really get our arms around this and really start producing the product we want to do, we want to have for the aged community in Santa Cruz County. So thank you for everything. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just also want to extend my gratitude to both of you for doing this work. Um, having, uh, of course, just doing a lot of uh, outreach in the course of arriving at this position and then also working with organizations like Meals on Wheels and uh, delivering meals to seniors. You just, first of all, realize um, you know, how many seniors there are in our community um, and also a lot who are in need. And um, there's so many pieces of this. I mean, the food security, but also having um, places that folks can walk to, to be in community, uh, to, you know, continue to be connected with, um, with others, and then also to access services. Uh, you know, one of the most impactful stories uh, while I was delivering uh, food with Meals on Wheels was um, about how um, one senior could now walk to the new health clinics in Live Oak area um, since those have opened um, and just really enjoyed that process of making the, the pilgrimage. Um, so, and of course, we've got to continue to protect the Live Oak Senior Center uh, as a source for services to many uh, folks in the uh, in Mid-County. So thanks again for all your work. Thank you. Supervisor Cummings. First, I want to thank you all for the presentation today. Thank you for all your work. And then I just want to thank uh, Supervisor McPherson and Friend for all their work to help bring this forward um, and being proactive of addressing age in our community because it's a very, based on the data that you showed us, you know, it's something that we really need to take seriously. Um, but I also just want to reflect on the fact that you all highlighted something that's really critical around our workforce and the ability of people who are in some of our critical positions to be able to live in this county. Um, you know, I, I know that we have differing opinions, some of us on on housing and how we can go about addressing this, but it does really, you know, bring up the fact that we need to have a community where working people can live and that we have housing that's being built to support them because in the absence of that, um, we're going to find ourselves with people who are going to have a lot of needs and the providers not being there just because of the sheer fact that the people can't afford to live here. And so I hope that as we continue to, um, you know, look at the area, um, the, the plan on, on, on aging communities that we're taking into account that we need to be able to support the young working people who we need to support those who are aging in our community as well. And so I just wanted to express that because as someone who um, is, is within that age group and is within that um, that um, income category. It's really important that we're looking out for the people who can help support our seniors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, Super, Supervisor Friend for uh, mm -hmm. bringing this program. You know, the AARP uh, age friendly communities program is really a multifaceted program that has a bunch of different programs and. We got the opportunity to do a AARP a walking needs assessment in Watsonville, where we did an assessment of of uh, making sure that it's age friendly, uh, pedestrian friendly for for all ages, right? And so we identified areas in the city uh, that we needed to address. So it really makes sense that we partner with public health and different partners, and we we bring all these uh needs together for for um to make a, a age friendly community but it, it's like i said it's multifaceted even with like needs assessment for for walking and uh bike and pedestrian safety so it's uh really happy that we're participating in this thank you thank you it's pretty rare that you see a trend line on a vertical plane like that and have it actually be real i mean you normally see projections but this is something that's easily quantifiable because you know the current ages of people so it's pretty easy to project out and it's just remarkable to see that kind of growth not just in the state but in particular locally and i think that to a point that you'd raised mr kemp that because there's a slow burn to this it's kind of hard sometimes to it feels like it's easier for the state or local governments to respond to emergencies 
right? You, you need something, a catalyzing event. And this is something that requires early investment. And so just appreciate that there is investment occurring. Um, we're a few years into this process, but it does feel like now, as you pointed out, there's, there's additional both attention and financial investment occurring to stay clearly at the local level as well organized. Uh, process, but that just, that it was a very powerful visual to see uh, that change. And also recognizing, I mean, it's not, uh, it depends upon where you are in the county, but there's a large growth in the youth in South County, but you know, there's a large growth in, in older folks uh, in other parts of my district and other parts of, of the county and just uh, how we're gonna deal with, with um, every issue that this county has from affordable housing, as Supervisor Cummings mentioned, but to, transportation to health capacity, all of them are going to become acute as a result of this shift. Um, and so there isn't gonna be a single sector that's not gonna be touched associated with it. And so I appreciate that that there's leadership working on this right now. Uh, again, a non-action item, but an opportunity for members of the community uh, to address us. I recognize there have been some people that have been waiting here. Um, if they would like to address us on this item, feel free to step forward. Thank you for your uh, patience on this item. Hi there, my name is Kelly Mercer-Lebov and I'm with the uh, city of Santa Cruz and I run the senior programs there. Uh, I just wanted to commend the county of Santa Cruz for this reaching this milestone as a, an age-friendly designated county. And um, I just wanted to also comment on the collaborative process that we've all taken steps to get to this point. And I sincerely look forward to the city of Santa Cruz also reaching this milestone, hopefully by the next couple of months. So thank you so much for taking this leadership step and for bringing us all together, both for the age-friendly designation as well as the master plan on aging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership with the city. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting on this. Good morning. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren Cookie, and I'm here in the spirit of collaboration. I work for uh, Common Spirit Health, which is the corporate partner that owns Dignity Health locally, Dominican Hospital. Um, I'm the system director leading uh, Common Spirit's health initiative to become an age-friendly designated hospital healthcare system. So um, I would like to meet you guys. <laughs> um, and I want to congratulate you all. It's uh, this data, as you can see, is just incredible for what's happening to our population. Such a high need. And um, we are all the way down from our CEO, extremely sponsored to help make this happen to reach a designation two through the um, IHI. Um, hospital institution a care for improvement and um, super motivated to partner with our local community to help bring our hospital system to an age for the designation. So I'd like to pass on my card and hope that we can talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Good morning. Good morning. Becky Steinbrunner. I live in Rho Aptos. And um, I think one of the most devastating um, situations for the aged population is a feeling of isolation and uh, simply not having a purpose anymore. I'm sure that that will come up in the surveys a lot, but I would really like to see our county come up with some um, programs, perhaps through the volunteer center. I know there is some of that already, uh, wherein. Um, Senior citizens are really actively involved in the community, working with youth, working with that 30% population of Watsonville under 18, and um, giving them a sense of purpose and a sense of connectedness in their community. And, and the community benefits by their wisdom. <laughs> I mean, they've, we <laughs> have lived and seen many things and learned many things. Um, I also ask that this survey be put out directly to all mobile home parks and also to the county's commissions so that it gets widespread coverage and involvement by many circles. Um, I would like to see it advertised in the newspaper. Um, older people tend to still read the newspaper. And um, also that the state survey also be advertised. I understand that you're trying to separate the two. I ask this board to support and fund the IHSS in-home support services that this county offers. 
pay those workers because they're the ones that are helping our aged community stay out of the nursing homes and in a healthier environment that they will thrive much better in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted, Mr. Chair, I just want to add one thing. I think it's necessary. I, I appreciate those comments, but one of the five uh, major goals that uh, we have in this master plan for aging is uh, inclusion and equity, not isolation. And she, you are absolutely correct. This is a really uh, big point uh, to how we can serve our, our aged community in Santa Cruz County. So I appreciate that, your point. Anybody else in chambers? Anybody online, Madam Clerk? Yes, we have speakers. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I'm 81 years old. You stated the crisis is now. Yes, we're being um, harmed in many ways. And I've addressed this to you many times before you led the putting in the 5G all over my neighbor's 4G uh, supervisor friend. Neurological symptoms near cell towers. And the symptoms are always also referred to as rapid aging syndrome, as well as electrohypersensitivity. Here's a list. Fatigue, sleep disturbances, headaches, feeling of discomfort, difficulty concentrating, uh, depression, memory loss, hearing disruption, dizziness, loss of appetite, and the list goes on and on. Okay, here's what we need, if you want to be real about it. We need this assault of radiation removed. That means remove the Wi-Fi, the antennas, the cell towers, etc. This is a crisis. And I'll just tell you personally, some places I avoid going to because I experience these symptoms. The Board of Supervisors Chambers, you have lots of Wi-Fi, all kinds of radiation emitting devices, including cruise IO facilities on the roof, 5G antenna there at ocean and water and the medium. I rarely go to libraries or senior centers where I used to go. This is a theft. This is harm. This is exclusion. Movie theaters, rarely. Buses Thank now you, have Garrett. all... Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is anybody else online? There are no more speakers. Okay. Well, uh, so ahead, just sure. to to celebrate our collaboration on this on this ambitious effort, and to celebrate our acceptance into the Age Friendly Network, we would respectfully request your board to take a photo with us and our partner from the City of Santa Cruz. All right, well, we're all dressed. So I think we could do that. We're all dressed up up here. Perfect. So Thank where you. would you like to do it? Just we'll do it at the at the base right there. Or do you want to come? Do you want to come up? You can come up. Yeah, go ahead and come up. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, item 10, to a public hearing to consider accomplishments of the community development block grant numbers 18 CDBG 12931, 18 CDBG 12930, and 2020 CDBG CV 2 slash 3. 000239, adopt resolution accepting the Davenport domestic water feasibility study final report and take related actions as outlined in the memo. Uh, the Deputy CAO uh, and Director of Community Development and Infrastructure, 
We have the uh, agenda board items. We have the resolution. We have the cover page. We have a lot of exciting things here. We have Ms. Wilson, right? Uh, our housing specialist. Welcome. Thank you for waiting for this item. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good morning, um, administrators. So as you know, the housing department um, administers various housing and community development grants, including the CDBG or community development block grants. Um, a requirement of funding these programs, specifically with CDBG, is that we hold a public hearing to discuss the accomplishments. So the first one was um, the county was awarded two 2018 CDBG grants. The first grant was for $421,000 in CDBG funds. The county also had $40,000 in CDBG program income, which is um, previous issued grants made or loans made to uh, different projects that are repaid. Um, this project included replacing the Nuru fascia trim and security lighting on Hardinas del Valle, which is an 18 unit of 100% affordable project out in Watsonville. Uh, the national be benefit um, with completing this project is that all farm worker households are low income. Uh, this project was completed, I believe, in early November, so it met, it was done prior to the heavy rains. The second project, um, also funded with 2018 CDBG funds, was the Davenport Domestic Water Feasibility Study. Uh, this study included um, looking for a pump station installation at San Vicente Creek intake serving the community of Davenport. Uh, the project was completed by consultant Jen Kennedy Jenkins. And the national objective for this was an income survey that was completed in Davenport, which showed that at least 51% of the low income area benefit was being served. Um, I do have staff from CDI staff available here if you have any questions regarding this project. The third grant reporting for closeout is the first of our four CDBG CV uh, grants that were awarded in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the remaining three CDBG CV grants are still finishing up the remaining funds and we will be coming back to your board to do a presentation for the closeout of those probably at the beginning of 2024. Uh, this grant, um, as you may recall, was um, awarded to Meals on Wheels to provide funds to provide senior breakfast. Seniors were provided with breakfast packs, which included cereal, eggs, juice, milk. A total of 353 seniors in the unincorporated area benefited from this program. Um, the national objective is met as, as seniors are deemed low income. And so any activity funded through CDBG meets the national objective. So recommended actions is that we you open this for a public hearing on the accomplishments of the county's 20 CDBG 2018 and 2020 community development block grants uh, for the 2018 multifamily housing rehab at Jardinas del Valle, 2018 domestic water feasibility study and the 2020 CV2 grant Meals on Wheels breakfast packs program. Uh, number two, accept and file this report on the accomplishments of the 2018 and 2020 CDBG grant activities listed above and adopt a resolution accepting the Davenport Domestic Water Feasibility Study final report and authorize a director of community development and infrastructure to execute and submit the final CDBG grant completion reports to HCD for these grants. Thank you. Some outstanding accomplishments. Appreciate your work on that. Are there any questions from any board members before we open up the public hearing? Uh, I just want to thank the staff for doing this um, and our outside organizations who contributed to this. Uh, it, it shows you how long everybody thinks, so oh, you can get a grant for this and it's easy to do. These are projects that are five, you know, three years old or something. And uh, it's really terrific to have uh, to uh, benefit the housing situation in Wattsville, the water situation in Davenport, and then the general Meals on Wheels as well. It's uh, really great. It's, it doesn't happen overnight, but uh, thank you for your determined and ongoing efforts to make this a reality. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now open up the public hearing. There's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on this item during this public hearing. Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos. I'm happy to see some brick and mortar work done with this money um, to benefit the 
the farm worker housing at 76 Murphy Road. Um, I I would like I like to see money spent on things that really make a physical change for people. And while a feasibility study is an important thing, um, I would really like to see something done more to um, really get the show on the road. And I, I have uh, questions about whether LAFCO has been consulted, in go including uh, possible consolidation with the city of Santa Cruz for their water supply. Uh, the North Coast streams are nearby. And um, while it is a separate project, the reclaimed water project that happened in Davenport has not been put to use as had been hoped. So these really studies are great, but if the project that comes from them does not really serve the people, does not really in the end accomplish what was needed, such as the reclaimed water in uh, Davenport, no farmers are using that water. And um, for, for various reasons, some are not farming, some cannot afford the water, some cannot afford the connections to the water. So I hope that this feasibility study will be far reaching and um, really have some good analyses of alternatives to using solely San Vicente Creek and perhaps partnering with the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers during this public hearing? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? There are no speakers online. All right, we'll close the public hearing, bring back to the board for action. Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, first, I'd just like to thank the staff for all their hard work on this. Um, it's really great to see uh, government being effective. And so just hope we can continue to, uh, as we move forward, you know, have similar outcomes and on projects. And so I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. Second. Motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Cummings. A second from Supervisor Hernandez. We'll get up a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Move on to item 11, a jurisdictional hearing to consider an appeal of application number 211209, an application to subdivide a 2.3 acre parcel and construct seven single family dwellings on property located at the southeast corner, the in intersection of Tremblay and Cunningham Way in the Papero Valley Planning Area APN 051-411-20 as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO Director of Community Development. And infrastructure, we have the board memo, the appeal letter, the PC staff report, as well as some of the comments. I believe that the presentation today, Mr. Adams, welcome back. Good to see you. Good morning, Randall Adams of the Planning Division. <clears throat> as mentioned, this is the appeal of the Planning Commission's action to approve subdivision and residential development permit 211209. I'd like to present a brief summary of the proposed development and review process and would like to acknowledge that we appreciate everyone's time and patience regarding this matter, waiting for this item today. Subject property um, project site is approximately 2.3 acres and it's located at the southeast corner of Trembley Lane and Cunningham Way in the urbanized residential area to the north of the city of Watsonville, which is accessed from Green Valley Road. It's here, left side of the image. Oh, move forward. Um, the subject property is located in the R110 single family residential zone district, which is also in the urban low density residential general planned land use designation. I'm some trouble with these slides here. There we go. Um, the parcel is affected by wetland and riparian resources, agricultural buffer setbacks, and a mapped earthquake fault zone. As you can see, these surround the property, and the property does have a number of these issues. Biotic, uh, geologic, and geotechnical reviews were completed to address these potential impacts. The subdivision is to divide the property into seven residential parcels, parcels located within a common area. Development parcels and shared improvements are arranged to avoid these resource constraints on the site. Subject property is within the urban services line. Water and sewer services are available to serve the project with annexation into the sanitation district and extraterritorial water service, which is outside the city limits to connect these utilities to the vacant property. An environmental review was completed for the project, which included the preparation of an initial study culminating in a mitigated negative declaration. And this included mitigations related to biotic resources to address potential impacts. 
since the action of the Planning Commission to approve this item on May 24th, 2023, the, uh, we received an appeal from legal counsel representing David Curtis, a neighbor to the proposed development. The appellants have argued that the environmental review for the project was inadequate and that the project should have required the preparation of an environmental impact report. The appeal letter identifies individual areas in which they felt that the environmental review and the project review process did not adequately address resource concerns and potential impacts. As noted in the letter to your board, all the topic areas raised in the appeal letter were considered and evaluated by staff in the review of the application. The environmental coordinator and planning staff have not identified any area in which the arguments raised by the appellant would warrant the preparation of an environmental impact report, and there are no substantive or procedural issues related to the Planning Commission's action to approve the project. None of the grounds specified in the county code for taking jurisdiction of the, of the Planning Commission's approval have been met. I'd also like to add that this has been a long process for the applicant where many detailed technical reviews have been prepared over a number of years and evaluated by staff to reach the conclusions presented in the administrative record. This project will also provide much needed housing in the region. With that, staff recommends that your board conduct a jurisdictional hearing to consider whether to take jurisdiction of the appeal of application 211209 and that your board decline to take jurisdiction of the appeal of application number 211. 209. And that concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. As a reminder to the board, what's before us is whether or not we take jurisdiction. It's not about the merits of the individual project. There are very specific uh, findings that we would need to make, um, which were included in the staff report, but just to remind the community that there was an error of abuse of discretion on the part of the Planning Commission, Zoning Administrator, or other officer, a lack of a fair or impartial hearing. The decision appealed from is not supported by the facts presented and consider the time the decision was uh, appealed was made. Significant new evidence relevant to the decision, which cannot have been presented at the time the decision appealed from was made, and either that there's an error, abuse of discretion, or some other factor which renders the act done uh, or determination made unjustified or inappropriate to the extent that a further hearing before this board or whatever we would remand it is necessary. So now we're going to open it up for an opportunity uh, for the appellant. Is there is the appellant here or is the appellant online for counsel? Please feel free to step forward, sir, for 10 minutes. Um, to speak to uh, these elements. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for your patience today. We recognize it's been a bit of a long morning. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for your attention. David Curtis, um, resident, county resident, 50 years. Um, on advice of counsel, I'm gonna read from the letter. Dear chair, friend, and members of the Board of Supervisors, this law firm represents David Curtis, a resident of Santa Cruz County, concerned with the county's decision to approve a mitigated negative declaration when a full environmental impact report is necessary for application 211209. Considering a proposal to create a seven lot residential district subdivision, sorry, residential subdivision, on an existing 2.3 acre lot, et cetera, et cetera. If you, uh, we've all heard that. Um, on May 24, 2023, the Planning Commission considered an application submitted by Kamala Dane Dia Dev LLC for a subdivision, residential development exception, agricultural buffer setback reduction, riparian exception, and roadway roadside exception. The project involves division of a 2.3 acre lot into a seven single family residential lots. The residential subdivision would be a common interest development with separate individual parcels for each building envelope and common area yards and landscaping surrounding each proposed building site. After the commission considered the application, staff re recommendations and public testimony, the commission voted to approve the project. The Board of Supervisors should take this appeal and deny the project because an EIR, environmental impact report, is required for this project. The mitigated negative declaration fails to adequately address several environmental impacts such as greenhouse gas emission impacts, biological resource impacts, agricultural impacts, and airport related impacts, and has also fallen short of presenting sufficient mitigation measures 
for several of the project's significant environmental impacts. Moreover, because the project involves a new subdivision and creating new lots, the findings for a riparian exception should not have been made. One, preparation of an environmental impact report is required for this project. This project requires an environmental impact report because a fair argument exists that the project may have a significant effect on the environment. Now, there are uh, citations all through this paragraph, um, and I think I'll skip those, but uh, all these statements have been tested. Um, the project uh, significant effect on the environment. Quote, there is a low threshold requirement for preparation of an environmental impact report and preference for resolving doubts in favor of environmental review. Courts have repeatedly affirmed that the fair argument standard is a low threshold test. That's in quotes. Uh, citation, citation. If a lead agency, and this is another quote from the uh, court proceedings, if a lead agency is presented with a fair argument that a project may have a significant effect on the environment, the lead agency shall prepare an environmental impact report, even though it may also be presented with other substantial evidence that the project will not have a significant effect. Next quote, a negative declaration is inappropriate where the agency has failed either to provide an accurate project description or to gather information and undertake an adequate environmental analysis. In addition, the mitigated negative declaration improperly defers analysis of environmental impacts as well as mitigations to a future date. Quote, by deferring environmental assessment to a future date, the conditions run counter to that policy of the California Environmental Quality Act, which requires environmental review at the earliest feasible stage in the planning process. A mitigated negative declaration is proper, to, proper, quote, only if project revisions would avoid or mitigate the potentially significant effects identified in an initial study, quote, to a point where clearly no significant effect on the environment would occur and there is no substantial evidence in light of the whole record before the public agency that the project as revised may have a significant effect on the environment. Four minutes. Three, failure to adequately analyze impacts to biological resources. The mitigated negative declarations analysis and mitigation for the environmental impacts to the wetland and oak wood habitat are insufficient. The mitigated negative declaration states that, quote, the biotic reports determined that wetlands, oak woodlands, and habitat for nesting birds occur on the project site and recommends avoidance and minimization measures for protection of these species and or habitats, close quote. Furthermore, it, uh, the mitigated negative declaration states, quote, two wetlands were identified on the parcel during the wetland days. Delineation studies conducted in May of 2018 and confirmed during the July 2019 wetland review. Wetland one occurs in the southwestern portion of the study area on sloped terrain that appears to receive surface and near surface runoff from upslope. Wetland two occurs in the eastern portion of the study area in a shallow swale at the toe of a slope. The 2018 wetland study and the 2019 wetland review consider wetland two as a remnant of the a riparian quarter corridor of stream 533 um, remnant. Some of these words tend to, uh, I think, trivialize the actual, what you would see if you came, um, that remnant extends all along uh, the back of the properties along Cunningham Way and at the northern end crosses under the road and ends up coming out of a culvert. And um, I'm not sure where all that water comes from. 
but it's much bigger than these statements might imply. Um, an intermittent stream, repairing part of stream 533, an intermittent stream which crosses the adjacent parcel downslope to the east. Then, um, however, despite this recognition, the mitigated negative declaration does not contain any analysis of the actual impacts a seven lot residential subdivision would have on the wetland areas. Um, so um, there are, I don't know, five or six or seven more. There's cumulative impacts, mandatory findings of significance. Um, you have to uh, consider these small impacts that may happen in this particular um, project in, how did I say, the whole area, all, all small impacts all over. You have to, these things have to be um, quantified. So, um, There's a lot of stuff here. I hope you all would read it. Have you, you guys read these things? I'm going to end there. I had hoped to read this entire thing, but it is quite long. And um, it seems that all these statements here are um, supported by court cases. And um, I think that the uh, California Environmental Quality Act is a uh, piece of work that um, took quite a lot of effort. There's a lot in there, a lot of study, and uh, people went to a lot of trouble to bring that about. And I think that uh, what it says in the California Environmental Quality Act should be uh, respected and adhered to. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here and would like to have 10 minutes as well? For this jurisdictional hearing. Good morning, or excuse me, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Friend. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm not going to need 10 minutes. Um, we're all kind of uh, ready to move along. But um, let me say, first of all, that your staff report does an excellent job of analyzing re and refuting every one of the points raised in the appellant letter. I think it's clear beyond any kind of doubt that the appeal is not substantive enough to warrant moving forward. Um, so I refer you to that staff report as an excellent uh, response. I'd like to make a couple other comments. First of all, um, the appellant had many opportunities to comment on the initial study in the NAG deck. It was in fact circulated two times for public review. And had the applicant or the appellant uh, concerns at that time, he could have raised them. They could have been dealt with by the staff at whatever level was appropriate. So that was not done, but here we are. I'd like to make a couple of quick notes about CEQA. The appellant mentioned the low threshold for a fair argument. It's lower than, um, you know, uh, other thresholds in CEQA, but it's not non-existent. So let's look at what a significant effect is. Under CEQA, a significant effect means a substantial or potentially substantial adverse change in any of the physical conditions within the area affected by the activity, including air, water, minerals, et cetera. Okay, word substantial. Also under CEQA, it says under uh, 15064B1, for those keeping score at home, 
the determination by a lead agency of whether a project may have a significant effect on the environment calls for careful judgment based to the extent possible on scientific and factual data. That's exactly what the county did. They required numerous studies. They conducted numerous reviews. They even had peer review on the wetland and biotic uh, information. So this was not done lightly. This was done with great care by the county. Third point, let's go back to the word substantial. In CEQA, substantial evidence means reliable information on which a fair argument can be made to support an inference or conclusion, okay? Reliable information. But more importantly, CEQA also dis decides what doesn't count as substantial evidence. It says, substantial evidence does not include argument, speculation, unsubstantiated opinion or narrative, or evidence which is clearly inaccurate or erroneous. And I would submit to you that all the things brought up in that appeal letter really fall under the second category of substantial evidence that does not meet a standard of not including argument, speculation, et cetera. So I think you should deny the appeal. We'd like to... Um, just move on with the project. It's, it's, uh, I've been working on this for more than five years and uh, we're ready to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, normally we afford about a two minute opportunity for the appellant if there was any additional comments I wanted to make on those comments. Is there any additional comments you'd like to make uh, in response to that? And then we'll forward the same to the applicant and then we'll move uh, to the community. David Curtis, thank you for this opportunity. Um, all I can say is uh, as to the um, comment that many opportunities were given to make these statements in years past, that's true. And um, uh, concerns were raised. Um, and also, I think we, uh, everyone involved figured that um, the um, normal process, the legal qualifications and whatnot would uh, just naturally, of course, uh, take care of it. But um, it seems that there's some kind of breakdown somewhere and it seems like things are being ignored. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that because my brain is a little scattered right now. Um, the applicants um, comments seem uh, not as substantial as uh, what I have here. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything that you, from the applicant for two minutes that you'd like to say, or do you feel? Okay. I would now open it up to the community. Is there any member of the community that would like to speak to us specifically about whether or not the board should take jurisdiction in this item and speaking to the uh, reasons for jurisdiction? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I have been in Mr. Kern's shoes a few times. And um, I feel your board should take jurisdiction just to help him and the community where he lives have a, a voice to you. He said their community had trusted that the county would, would pay attention to their comments. Well, I've learned, having come through this, that that doesn't often happen. 
by example, the very dense Aptos Village project also got a negative mitigated declaration, and it should not have had that. <laughs> Many people raised concerns, important concerns, but it's, it didn't matter. So I ask that your board take jurisdiction um, to, to give Mr. Kearns and his community an opportunity to come before you with their concerns that they did raise, but were not heard. I would want to know that um, the woodlands there um, may support solitary roosting bats. I would want to know how the storm drainage will be handled effectively. All storm water must stay on site for a two-year storm. By county code, did it meet that? It is near riparian areas. How will this large increase in impervious surface affect these wetlands, especially if we have another winter like we've just had? And um, I would like to know, we've not seen any pictures. There was a brief glimpse of some large structures. What about the aesthetics? Was that truly um, analyzed? And is it, uh, does it comport with the character of the community? Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online? Yes, we have speakers online. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I also think the board should take jurisdiction. And um, Becky Steinbrunner brought up some excellent points, having also observed over the years um, cell tower applications, probably hundreds of them. There's always a check for negative declaration for California Environmental Quality Act, whereas the evidence clearly demonstrates very harmful negative environmental impacts on birds and bees and fauna. There are also fires by these cell towers. So negative declaration is an improper category to mark off. In, in my opinion, we need to be protecting nature, neighborhoods, the environment. And if we don't have a healthy environment, we basically don't have any rights. So I think the board should take jurisdiction. Thank you. There are no further speakers online. Okay, we'll close all the public hearing and public comment part of this and bring it back to the board for consideration of this item regarding jurisdiction. Are there comments or a motion from board members? Or questions? Yeah, please, excuse me. I had three, three questions. Uh, one is, when did this project first come to the planning, planning counters and what's the current maximum density levels for this project? and you know, the, the last one, your guys' um, staff report was good and it kind of addresses it. But initially, I, I went to see the the uh, initial study and the mitigated negative, negative declaration, which was trying to find some of the responses for the concerns that the, the appellant had. But it, it seems that, and, you know, the staff report just really spells it out clearly, but Aren't most of the concerns, or almost all of the concerns, addressed in the initial study and neg in the mitigated negative negative declaration? They're correct. So, uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Hernandez. The, the three questions: the the application first came um, to uh, our department actually back in 2014 under a different version, and then there were some other reasons that it was not moving forward. But it was beginning to address some of these technical issues. Things like the, the 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 geologic information there, since so it's near a fault zone, that trenching took some time. The biotic reports took some time. 
It did actually go to the Agricultural Policy Advisory Commission in that earlier iteration. So we, we brought that forward. So it's been going on for a long time. This particular application came in, in uh, 2021, which is why it has the application number it does. So that's when I started working on it. And then we took it through the environmental review process. And um, like you'd said, uh, the, the mitigated negative declaration is actually a result of an extensive environmental review, which is built on you know, the legs of all these technical reviews and technical studies that were performed at the expense of the applicant, which were then peer reviewed or, or reviewed by, by uh, staff members, depending on what type of review it was, because we have qualified persons on staff. And um, I'm not sure if I'm getting to your last question, um, but yes, the content of all that information is in there. Did I miss the second question, perhaps? No, the third one. Um, what's the because it's seven units, but what what's the current maximum density levels? Because I know there's been a lot of regulation changes that it, allow for more density now. Correct. So it's very interesting. So um, when we look at development, we look at the amount of net developable land, and a lot of these resources and constraints can have impacts on that. And so the the, the areas are deducted are the biotic areas and so forth. And then um, that's under a conventional form of development. This development started a while ago. They had plans in place. If this was to not be approved, and I'm not recommending that you do that. That's not our staff recommendation. The the applicant could go ahead and come back with a design under newer laws that utilizes the whole um, gross area of the site. But under the current method that we're doing it, under the current proposal and deducting the land that we deducted, it is at the maximum density it can be in the R110 zone district, which is 10,000 square feet of net developable land per dwelling unit. And they have that for each dwelling unit and they don't have an additional 10,000 square feet. So they couldn't even put in an eighth unit if they wanted to, unless they came back as perhaps a density bonus project or some other thing. We've had that conversation with, with the, the applicant. They've spent a lot of money getting this design, this engineering, this move forward, and it's it, they, they would like to move forward with this project the way it is. So it, it is at its current maximum density uh, in the way it's presented today, not using any of the special state laws or newer regulations that you mentioned. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion? Well, you know, I, I have to say that um, I reviewed some of the, the planning minutes and I have to say it was well debated in there. Uh, and I had the opportunity to discuss the matter with my planning commissioner and, uh, he, you know, she was, you know, saying, you know, that she was uh, also debated the matter as well. And I, you know, we briefly reviewed the, the, the initial study and the negative, mitigated negative declaration together as well. And I have to say, I, I was satisfied with the findings in, in both um, documents. And so I, I might have to agree with the, the planning commissioners. You know, I think that they fully considered all the testimony and evidence. And uh, I think that, you know, I think I'm going to go with staff's recommendation to deny the appeal. Yes. Is that a motion for the uh, recommended yes, action? I'll make the motion for recommended action. Yes. Okay. Second. We have a second, or excuse me, we have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez and a second from Supervisor Koenig for the recommended actions, which is to conduct the jurisdictional hearing and to decline to take jurisdiction. Is there any additional conversation? All right. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Thank you, everybody that waited all morning for that item. We'll move on to item 12, which is to consider approval and concept of ordinance amending section 13.32.060 before the Santa Cruz County Code regarding qualifications of experts for special rent adjustments proceedings to expand the list of eligible third-party experts and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on August 22nd, 2023 as outlined in the memo of myself and Supervisor Koenig. We have the board memo, the amendments, including a strikeout and underline in the ordinance amending it. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for uh, all of your collaboration and work on bringing this ordinance forward. Um, of course, the majority of mobile home parks in our county do fall within the first and second district. So, of course, that's why I um, consider to continue to look at this as a very important issue to address. Uh, this change today proposed to 1332, the mobile home rent adjustment ordinance uh, is incremental, but it's important. And it demonstrates this board's continued commitment to maintaining mobile home parks as an affordable housing option in our community. 
I couldn't help but take note during uh, the presentation uh, about uh, the master plan for aging, the, the five bold goals. The goal number one is housing for all ages and stages, uh, and certainly mobile home parks house uh, thousands of our seniors in this community. So just a, a little bit of history about how we got here. Um, the board has gone in recently and made some adjustments to strengthen the mobile home rent adjustment ordinance. The first was August 2021. Uh, we extended the rent control protections in mobile home parks for inherited properties, uh, as well as properties that were foreclosed on. So that means that uh, folks can um, inherit a mobile home and the rent control provisions will be maintained, uh, which of course is really important to maintaining affordable housing in our community. Then uh, just at the end of last year, December 2022, we uh, went in again and um, a, a closed a loophole in this ordinance that would have uh, allowed park owners to increase rents by as much as 10% a year. Ultimately, this was uh, ordinance was first written at a time when higher inflation prevailed uh, and we realized that it was no longer Import, uh, no longer appropriate to have uh, that provision in there. And we also strengthened the arbitration process for special rent adjustments to prevent big rent increases uh, for parks. And so this uh, is just an incremental change in that special uh, rent adjustment proceeding. Um, we, as uh, the, the memo describes, um, we had we require an expert to review the proposal for special rent adjustment uh, before even it goes to a hearing officer or before uh, it gets litigated. And uh, in our definition of what an expert who would qualify as an expert, uh, we require that they be a CPA. Uh, and this change will simply say that um, we will also consider other types of experts who are very familiar with mobile home park law and uh, rent adjustment proceedings. So that ultimately will broaden the uh, potential pool of experts that can deal with the situation in our community. And I did say, you know, it's important. I think one of the reasons for that is that uh, we are hearing about a number of potential special rent adjustments that could come forward due to um, impacts on parks from the past winter storms. And I think that it's important that we have as large a pool as possible of experts uh, who can help to uh, work on these cases as they come forward. So yeah, that's, that's it happening. Thank you, Supervisor Cohen. And, and just as to clarify, this did was we did pass this through the Mobile Home Commission. We are commissioners, and this was both recommended and supported by them. Um, we'll open it up for the community. Is there any member of the community here in Chambers that would like to address us on this change? Seeing none, is there anybody online? There are no speakers online. All right, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for a motion. Supervisor Koenig, recommended actions. I'll second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig, a second from Supervisor Cummings. And we got a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings, for making it through the, the meeting. I know you got to get going. We do have closed session. Will there be anything reportable out of closed session? No. All right, then we are going to move into closed session right now. Thank you, everybody, and for Community TV for broadcasting.